Welcome. Everybody. My name is Brian. That is Shane, and this is Rob, and we are talking about Strange New Worlds season two, episode well four, five, and six. But because Rob wasn't here on Monday, we're gonna get, we're gonna let him share his thoughts about one, two, and three. But Shane, I'm sure you want to start with uh, some other stuff. So what do you want to do, bro? Yes, non spoilers, guys. Listen, non spoilers. We were we had the wonderful benefit of. Uh, of um of being able to see episodes one through six and so we're trying to give you the non-spoiler stuff rob has also seen several of the episodes and he's got his opinion which he's going to share with us and and uh but first off i just wanted to do a little star trek legacy update um we did put out our video on um the 11 uh ways that they can bring captain shaw back in star trek legacy which we do as you well know have the uh, you know uh belief that star trek legacy will happen or some variation of that show will happen with terry metallis at the helm uh, so please go check out that video and give it some love because it is not getting the love it deserves. Um, and uh, with that, we do, if, if you guys want to go back and see our thoughts on episodes one through three and the non-spoilers, we did that on Monday. And uh, so Rob, it's so great to have you here, brother. How's your, uh, how's things going for you? Well, first of all, I just want everyone to know that I pickpocketed my six scale Axel Foley figure. There's his police ID. And the reason I did that was to get these handcuffs <laughs> In case I need to be restrained, <laughs> um, you know, I, need to be some. in in my bedroom play, I just don't have a pair of handcuffs. I'm sorry, <laughs> so I have these six scale handcuffs instead. So I'll, if I get if I get a little ornery, I'll be sure and lock my pinkies together or something like that. Absolutely. Okay, I think I'm fixing my mic. Let me guys, can you guys hear me better now? Yeah. Yeah. yeah you okay. Good. Cool. All right. Yeah. So, All right. Um, yeah. How do you want to do this? Well, I definitely would like to, you know, so if you guys go back, uh, Strange New Worlds is starting actually tonight at midnight. Uh, Strange New Worlds episode one will be coming out and you guys can be able to check that out tomorrow. We're going to be doing the full live review on it, uh, but we do want to give you the non-spoiler perception of what things are going. Uh, the way Brian and I talked about uh, episodes one, two, and three on Monday, um, you know, we kind of had mixed reviews on it. Um, one of the things we talked about with Star Trek, strange, especially with Strange New Worlds, is there's this sense and feeling that they're trying to be this kind of like fun, young, hip and mainstream show. Uh, and we talked about that. And I'm very curious to get Rob's feelings on it. So, Rob, uh, break it out. One through three. What did you think of those episodes? Uh, number two, episode two, I quite loved. Ed Astra mm. per Adam or whatever. You know, the, That's it, the, yep. mm -hmm. I, I, it is a courtroom drama. Uh, I thought it was really quite good. Uh, as I said, probably my favorite single episode in terms of episodics. Uh, uh, Picard season three, I think it was kind of one long story. Mm -hmm. But as a standalone episodic, it, it follows in the great tradition of Star Trek courtroom dramas that we've seen in all the different shows. Uh, but, you know, specifically... Um, uh, court martial in the original series in the first season and second season of TNG's Measure of a Man. Mm. And I thought that the actress that um, played this, I mean, I don't want to spoil, you can discover it, but the actress that played the defense attorney, call mm -hmm. her that, yep. was, I thought she was incredible. And she the, the first thing that I thought of when that episode was over, the character uh, of Samuel Cogley, that is introduced in court martial. They actually wrote a Star Trek novel about this character should team up with this woman. And they, if they want to do a Star Trek spinoff show of like the Star Trek Jag Corps or Star Trek law, you know, they should, <laughs> because those the, casting a cantankerous actor opposite this actress um, would be incredible. So I, I really enjoy that. However, however, um, one of the things about the episode that, drives me crazy is just how i called it didactic in a tweet um they they really think that the audience for this show is dumb mm. and and it, it's evidenced by in this episode and this is this is just to me this is a metaphor for all of modern star trek in this episode they actually have our this character giving a summation sort of a closing statement and in case you didn't get it they flash back to Rebecca Romaine's character who said these things about 10 minutes before in the same episode. It was repeated. And, and they show these shots again in case you didn't understand. And when I'm watching this, I'm like, this had to have happened in post. Whoever wrote this episode did not write it to be that way. Mm -hmm. And somebody, when they were cutting the episode together, said, you know what? 
just so the audience gets it, let's cut in flashbacks to something that was said 10 minutes earlier in the same episode. And I, I'm just like, um, okay, uh, yeah. that I'm not stupid. And why, why would you interrupt? This actress is giving this great monologue. She's fantastic. And, and then you're interrupting it with Rebecca Romaine. We already know she said all this. We're smart right. people. You know, and I did the I'm same thing in episode six, by the way. Uh, and well, I'm looking at this going, how dumb do they think we are? And I, when, when the filmmakers think their audience is stupid, this is one of Star Trek is supposed to be one of the most astute viewing audiences in the history of television. And when we have smart TV, whether you love Succession, whether you love Yellow Jackets, whether you what House of the Dragon, take your pick, whatever your favorite, Better Call Saul. We're a very sophisticated bunch these days. And when the people that are making Star Trek think of us as stupid, I, it, it, I want to I I just punch my screen. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, why do you... First of all, you're interrupting a great actress's performance. She's, she's, and they kept cutting to Rebecca Romaine saying the ex, they literally were the same shots, just repeated. Yeah. And I'm like, and, and with little color differentiation too. I'm like, what? The, what? And then um, mm -hmm. in that same episode... The, this show, all modern Star Trek, has a predilection for whenever they talk about, when they're, they're so didactic, when they want to get on the nose and talk about persecution, people that are persecuted, they always, let's show January 6th. You know, let's talk right. about In only, Earth, only yeah. Earth oppression. Well, how and, did you feel about the, the, okay, the way they discuss the oppression in this episode, in the courtroom episode? It is done through uh, alien as an alien oh that all that was analogy. great right. but when she gets up and talks about like federation history it was always mm -hmm. neat in the original series when they would use one thing that we knew and then they would give you like the poets of this planet or they would say something or give you three or four more examples from different mm -hmm. from fictional un fictional places and things that we'd never seen before mm -hmm. and it just added to the authenticity of what's going on right. and and by just just again by just hitting on things that we already know as opposed to making things up. Um, it was frustrating. Now, uh, uh, another thing that I, I, I really, here's the thing about Star Trek. This is just an overall note. Star Trek never took place. It is not our future. And, and I don't think the people who are making modern Star Trek understand it was never supposed to be our future. It's adjacent to our universe, mm. but it's not our universe. And there are things that the original Star Trek series did that are like when they actually quoted dates, when they went back in time, for instance, in um, Tomorrow Was Yesterday, or they went back in time where they were talking about, say, for instance, when Khan took over a quarter of the world's population. The eugenics Wars. Yeah. The Eugenics Wars. This was an immutable date. This was in the late 1990s. And then the post-atomic horror that is cited in encounter at Farpoint took place in the mid 21st century. Right. These are two different events. I don't think the people that are making modern Star Trek understand this because it was seen in Picard season two the same way. You're right. Absolutely. And, mm -hmm. and in, um, in this episode one, or pardon me, the third episode of the season one completely contradicts the original series timeline, which mm -hmm. then says to me that we're in an alternate universe. This is not the original. This is not a, prequel to the original star trek which also means that star trek discovery is not it they've they've definitively said by their own changes in their own timeline that this is a different universe so if it's a different universe well let me ask you this question so they keep insisting that it's not but yet it's obvious that so many of the choices they make put it in a different universe what could be the explanation as to between the two they're just not knowledgeable enough or they don't understand well star trek i mean i mean point? i i, I this think it's a very that, obvious mistake it's a, it's a, it's a, it, it, that's one of the things. And when I'm, and, and when I'm watching as an astute mm -hmm. viewer, they keep, first of all, the idea of who they've, who they put on the crew as uh, on the crew of the enterprise. We have Uhura. Mm -hmm. Do, does that work out? We have a descendant of Khan Noonien Singh. How does everyone know who Khan Noonien Singh is? Like 300, for 300 years, Khan's family tree has been, I guess, around all the time. That would tell you already. Why would he even have descendants on earth? That's something we right. don't know. You're right. Who, who, well, and, who, who and and why in Space Seed would they not immediately uh, be wary of this person? 
as soon as they know who he is. Especially if everyone the- knows about him, if he's so pro- prolific, he's like the Hitler of their time. So if Hitler shows up, at least someone's got to be like, all right, put this guy in. Well, in well but the not only right that, now. there's already somebody in Starfleet that's his descendant <laughs> when they discover him. And, that's weird. I, I, and that's it's weird. it's hard for me as an astute Star Trek viewer to like, I understand this is an, a, a stupid Akiva Goldsman idea. The man who wrote Batman and Robin, the man who wrote the Lost in Space movie. This is all Akiva Goldsman. And I, I don't think he thinks about it. He's like, wouldn't it be cool if they keep the fact that they keep going back to Space Seed? And I, the thing is, I can't a- address all this stuff directly because I don't want to spoil anything. Right. But I'll tell you something else. I hate the way Spock is portrayed in this series because it's everyone else that has made Spock who he is today, starting with Michael Burnham and Discovery. Yeah. In one of these episodes, we we see one of our principal crew members give Spock something, something iconic from the original series. So once again, this thing that we associate with Spock, it wasn't him that developed it. It was somebody had to give it to him. Some Mm. other character that happened to be on the Enterprise at the time. And, And between Spock having a learning disability, between Spock now this other thing that he does was given to him by another crew member. It's like, why, why does everybody want to diminish? What, what is the, the idea about diminishing Spock? They don't even understand Spock on this show. Right. Well, in episode four, they actually have a moment where, where um, uh, the helmsman actually says, you know, Spock still learning, which I thought was interesting. I'm like, he outranks her. What is she talking uh, First about? of all, Spock is also older. And and this idea that they, th- this is another thing that I cannot stand about New Trek. One moment when Spock smiles when he touches the plants, they have mistook that moment for this wild display of emotion. Vulcans have emotions. They just control them. And in, in that episode, in the Menagerie, a.k.a. the cage, you know, if Spock has made a scientific discovery... You know, he doesn't necessarily always have to be stoic. Mm-hmm. You know, he can show, he can show, like, instead of just raising his eyebrows. So in one moment of the pilot, before it's been defined, he smiles. They've taken that and turned it into Spock is not a fully formed person. Right. Well, I mean, and- I will say there there are a couple elements of the pilot where Spock is um, eager, I guess is the right word. There are sure. some elements of this. I mean, there. I do feel like. But the like idea, here's the thing. that. But here's the thing. Okay, that 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 is you have to you have to take that. Uh, I understand that's in the pilot. But mm-hmm. the thing about Spock is his character is that he had to be the best Vulcan. Mm-hmm. He had to be better than all the other Vulcans. That's right. Because he's a man of of two worlds. But they 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 want to either make it about his physiology. His physiology is dominant. His dominant physiology is Vulcan, mm-hmm. as evidenced by his ears, the fact that he suffers from pomp. Far. On far. Yeah. So he's been st- the fact that he was the first Vulcan in Starfleet. He's the best of the best already. And and the fact that, you know, they, and we've seen it in the trailer. What's your thing going to be? You know, the whole Picard engage. Mm-hmm. What's your thing going to be? If this well, show was, you think after you saw that. I. F- OK, <laughs> if Spock was t- if Spock was tasked, first of all, with coming up with a thing, mm-hmm. they wouldn't have showed you at the beginning. They would have showed you at the very end of the episode and what Spock would say, what his Mm. thing is, would have been the best thing. Mm. It would have been the coolest thing. It would have been not some, the man's not retarded. Mm. Mm -hmm. He's a student. He's, he's on a, he's serving in a, in a, in a, in a, on a crew with aliens from a thousand worlds. He's interacting with people. He's the smartest man on the ship. And here's the thing about Spock. Spock has a sense of humor because yeah. as we saw in the original series humor you can be logical and mm-hmm. you can still have i mean that's having a sense of humor and showing irony and things like that means you're an intellect it doesn't necessarily mean you're allowing your emotions to overpower you but at the end of mirror mirror when spock when they're making fun of spock with the beard spock says well gentlemen you know i too had a chance to observe your barbarism, you know, the very flower mm. of homo sapiens. I mean, he gives as good as he gets. Right. And so if someone tasks him to give, but they're not, the, these writers are not smart enough 
to understand this. The show, this show never takes the sophisticated route because the people writing it are not sophisticated people. How much and of that's it do you think has to do with the writers and also the fact that they're pandering to, you know, <clears throat> and I say this with as much respect as I can, the lowest common denominator of, of, of viewer? Well, well, that's another problem. <clears throat> Star Trek never, I mean, the original series never pandered to the lowest common denominator. It expected right. the audience to be smart. This show is inexplicably, that's why people, What you know what, the reason kids and college students loved <clears throat> Star Trek? Because of how smart it was. Mm. And now you have these writers. See, the thing about it was, the original Star Trek was created by writers who were trying to write a timeless show that was allegorical in nature, that would speak to everyone. Now, the writers who are writing the show don't know how to do that. They only know how to write for today. And they, they can't write timeless, th these shows are not timeless. They'll be horribly dated in 10 years. People yeah. are not going to be watching this show. It's in like 10 Star years Trek and... slash MacGyver or Star Trek slash Hawaii Five O, right? Yeah. 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 And, and it's, it's the mad ones. And, and the thing is, mm -hmm. even when they portray, like we see the Klingons in the first mm -hmm. episode, mm -hmm. they'll see tonight. Why is it that they can't portray that? They do not understand any of the alien species on this show. They're all dumbed down. The Klingons are dumbed down. The Romulans were dumbed down in the first season. The Gorn, what has been done with to the Gorn is criminal. Mm. They've turned the Gorn into <laughs> aliens yeah. instead of a, spa a proud spacefaring race that had comparable technology with the Federation. And, yeah. and everyone seems to know who they are. Whereas in right. Arena, no one knew who they were. That was Never the first meeting before. between the Federation. And, you know, they, they can't have it both ways. On one hand, they have turned the Gorn. I mean, I hate to say it, but in the I guess the alternative of being a racist would be a specious if you're against mm. a species. This show is specious against the Gorn. They've turned the Gorn into these literally into these othered monsters that are to be feared and destroyed that 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 feed they 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 use human beings or whatever to as birthing things. I mean, why did they, why did they have to this is a total fabrication of this show of strange new worlds and they're it, trying to turn them into a version of the borg so they want they're trying to get that element of of you well, know well first of all canonically they hadn't met yet so that's another right. so so you have to sit there and go okay none of this show takes place in the same universe as the original series because everything contradicts it mm -hmm. everything and Everybody. and i i can't and, and the thing is when i watch the show the thing that bothers me the most, and and the third episode, if you read up on it, does have a time travel. It's being reported as there's a time travel element in it. None of it makes any sense. None of, none of it. If you look at it closely, and you follow, because if if you look at the the how time travel works, how how it's been portrayed. Think about City on the Edge of Forever, Yesterday's Enterprise. That's what people are saying. It's a mix between Yesterday's yeah. Enterprise and City on the Edge of Forever. The thing is, once you uh, there's usually a moral or ethical dilemma that comes along with that, with the time travel, like Edith Keeler must die. Mm -hmm. The Enterprise C has to go back mm -hmm. in time and, and face the music and everyone's going to die except Tasha Yar or right. whatever. Now, that's that's a bitter pill to swallow. Well, they try and play that moral dilemma also, but the timeline's wrong. See, the timeline's wrong. So let's say the timeline wasn't wrong. Let's just take that one element out of it. What do you think of of the story itself and just in general? Because there is that element of having to make a choice uh, that that. Well, this is a Kirk episode, which we've shared with people already. And uh, we'd love to get your impression on what your initial Kirk feelings were. And now that it's not uh, a future version like it was in last season's final episode. What did you think of Kirk and what did you think of well, of the consequences of I, I do doing? have to say that the once Kirk would. I like the relationship that he develops with Leon. Mm -hmm. Leon. It's good. Yeah. I, I, I really like that. And I'm like, mm. why don't you just forget about this time travel element and you guys can just go hang around in 21st century Earth. I would love mm. to see they fall in love because clearly they're, first of all, okay. They, they didn't fuck. <laughs> I mean, are you kidding me? They play this whole thing where I, I was so, it made me so angry. I'm like, and, and to me, that's another thing. Let's, let's neuter our main characters. Let's neuter Spock. Let's neuter Kirk whenever we can. Right. Oh, unless he's with T'Pring, which also violates the timeline, but whatever. Mm, you know, true. and I, I, um, um, look, the shows, I love the actors. 
The actors are great. I think the cast is uniformly excellent. I think this season, Dr. Mbenga has been given a little bit more to do. He's, like fanta- He's fantastic. Yeah. I love him. And I, I love, I think the cast is actually really good. And I think that Ethan Peck does a great job of playing Spock. As far the as version of Spock that they've yes, created for the, him. The, that yes. they've created for him, I think. And I, you know, obviously Anson Mount's great. Mm-hmm. And the guest stars that they're bringing in are they're really, Anson really Mount, good. They've been Anson Mount, Anson Mount light, though, in this season so far. So the, the very Anson season, Mount light. Like, he must yeah. be doing something else. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, and I think the guest stars have been have been pretty for the most part pretty excellent. Yeah. But I'll tell you, I, I'll tell you what my biggest failing is with this show. It's not about anything so far other than Star Trek itself. Hmm. Like it's not. You watch all these shows and it's like, let's do time travel. Let's do. But what's the story that you're telling me? You know, I mean. The, the the story I want stories that are allegorical in nature like for instance you know you go back to original series the first season episode like a taste of Armageddon where you have a civilization that's fighting a war with computers and the computers are telling people okay you're dead you, this your city was bombed so you have to report to a disintegration chamber <laughs> this civilization so has turned war palatable mm-hmm. and and the point is monstrously horrible and Kirk is like, you 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 people have normalized war and because there's no destructive element to it because you don't have to see people die people just go into disintegration booths then you've learned to live with war mm. for a thousand years that's a hor- first of all great science fiction story horrifying moral and ethical tale absolutely and and so you think about the ramifications mm. afterwards these strange new world stories aren't really at least the first 6 episodes of the first 4 I've seen the first 4 really aren't about much (laughs) they're they're kind of just about they're about the star trek universe yeah yeah. as opposed to about being like an episode of black mirror which has something to say and it's it's it it bothers me because it it, again it speaks to the quality of the writing and and there's no science fiction writers anymore no no and the writers they have like i have to say that courtroom (laughs) episode was written by a, a girl, I forget her name, but I looked her up. I, I thought she did a, a wonderful job writing this, this, despite the fact that it's got a lot of identity politics going on and it's 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 very didactic and on the nose, but that's okay. It's a courtroom drama, I understand. But I thought she did a pretty good job of writing the relationship between um, Una and her friend who comes to defend her. And there's some good stuff going on there and the cast, the cast is is making this stuff work. But the writing is just not up to par. Even though right. I said this episode I thought was 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 really well written. Well, do you think that, uh, so based on season one and season two, and this is kind of what we've noticed, it does, it, even though there are problems, it does feel like season two is better than season one overall so far. Would you give it that? <clears throat> I, I, you know, I don't know if I would say it's better. I would say it's more of the same. Mm. Um, I, I really wish that they would lay off the Star Trek timeline. Like, tell me stories about people and places that I've never been to, mm-hmm. that I've never heard before, you know. Right. They, and, with which they have not done very well. Correct. No, no, take yeah. me somewhere. I mean, if you're going to go explore, go explore. Let's, let's find, because the whole thing about Star Trek was it used its alien races. The alien races were always us. Mm-hmm. They always had dilemmas that had something to do with what was going on Earth, uh, on Earth at the time. That's where the allegorical nature of it all came in. Mm. And and that's what I loved. You know, that's what uh, growing up, I love that. And it was the, the Enterprise had to figure out, OK, how do we how do we maintain our utopian post scarcity societal ideals and not mess up uh, this culture by violating the prime directive? Well, let me ask you a question. Even though Kirk that- frequently did violate the prime directive. <laughs> he, he did. Yeah. And we can talk about uh, Admiral Robert April in a second about that, too, because they had a really good he's had a couple of good scenes, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, going back to because we're so polarized today now in the 60s, um, there was this element of, you know, you're kind of told what you're told in the news. Not everybody had access to information. Not everybody was was as polarized with with one side or the other of what was happening in our country. And I think a lot of what Star Trek brought to people's view screens was was almost an introduction to what those ideas are, you know, the, the things that people are actually fighting out there. Do you think we could, 
Do you think Star Trek can tell a story with allegories of what's happening today without it really pissing off people? You know, how do you think they can do that and almost make it go like, oh, I didn't really understand it like that. Is it possible, do you think? Well, here, here's the problem. The writers are on only one, they're on one side of the culture war. Right. So I think that they're incapable. I mean, that's another problem with this show is that clearly it's being written from one ideological perspective. Mm. And I think that because of that, it harms the storytelling. And I, and I think that, you know, the, the, and I think that's problem. That's a problem through a lot of, of television um, and movies to a certain extent that the people that are writing, I mean, uh, uh, we all, uh, most people I would say that work in Hollywood are, are left of center. You know, I consider myself a classical liberal with left leanings. Mm -hmm. I, I don't recognize the far left today at all. Um, but but I but I think that most writers in Hollywood, there are conservative writers, but I can tell you for a fact that some people I know that are conservatives get shunned because yeah, of their yeah. conservative beliefs. I so I, I also think and and I think that the people that wrote the original series, believe it or not, even though it was in the 60s, I think had more diversity of opinion, personal diversity of opinion than today. And I think it's harming because what we have so many interesting things that are happening in our culture that could be the basis for great science fiction stories. And when I don't look, there's an episode four, maybe we can talk about this. You brought up the yeah. fact that they just used a, one of the Marvel comic books, which is interesting. So did Otoy when they were doing their short. Mm -hmm. They both they both Otoy when they were doing their shorts with Ensign Colt mm -hmm. and the because for, for those of you who don't know, Marvel Comics in the mid 90s, little mid to late 90s, took over the, the Star Trek franchise and were able took it away from DC and gave it to Marvel because Paramount did not like the idea that Warner Brothers that published DC was publishing their IP. Mm. So they gave it to Marvel, which was not owned by Makes Disney sense. at the time. So and the best of those comics was the Pike comic, the early voyages comic. Mm. And there they plundered an issue of that comic in this seat in this season and without giving credit again and there's this weird una's backstory came from uh dorothy fontana's novel vulcan's glory uh the fact that pike remembers or he has visions of when he has his accident yep. that came from margaret wanderer bonanno's novel burning dreams and they're 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 taking these story points and they're translating them from comics and novels, bringing them into canonical live action and not crediting the original originators of those ideas. And uh, with the guys or saying that, well, we already own this. Mm. Yeah. But, you know, when Dorothy Fontana wrote that novel, she didn't expect to get ripped off without right. being credited. I mean, you could at least say story by she's dead. It's the right thing to do. It is the yeah. right thing to do. They did this. Yeah. They did it with Arena. They took the story that was based on, uh, written by Frederick Brown, and it was very loosely based on the Frederick Brown. The Arena was very loosely based on Frederick Brown's story. But in Discovery, they even ripped off Harlan Ellison. If he was alive to see that they took his original concept for The Guardian of Forever, which IDW later published, mm -hmm. they, they just flat out stole. They changed Star Trek canon and changed and they're there because they're cheeky they're like well let's go back to the original harlan ellison idea of of this mm -hmm. which has much more of a doctor who feel to it right. and paul guilfoyle will now play the ambulatory guardian of forever who can wander around and knows everybody's past i mean they do this all the time this is another reason why i think the writing staff writing staffs of these shows uh are are guilty and yeah. and it, it's gross i think it's gross because if i was paying a writer to come up with a script I wouldn't expect them to go rip off. Why, why not use just chat GPT, especially in the middle of a writer's strike? The Star Trek writers are guilty of pilfering from other mediums and putting them in their own screenplays and saying that, oh, we already own this. Mm -hmm. Why well, didn't pay you to go adapt a comic book? Right. I paid and you to write a script. So is it because because they just can't do it or it's the path of least resistance or is it or is it it's both. You know, the showrunners that are like lack of expectation for their writers rooms? Do we have a lack of of expectation for the quality of writing that we put out <clears throat> today that could, could that no, be because we're seeing some of the best writing we've ever seen on television. It's just the people that control this franchise 
are ill-equipped to write good Star Trek. With, mm -hmm. I think, the exception of the writing staff for Star Trek Picard Season 3. Right. I mean, be, be, because, you, you know, the, that writing team that Terry Metalis put together already crafted an incredible show in 12 Monkeys. If you look at the four seasons of 12 Monkeys, that was a beautifully structured show that really showed that there was a lot of time and effort. Man, if you're going to write a time travel episode of Star Trek, you better understand your temporal mechanics, man. Yeah, I mean, you can't, you can't, you, you have an audience with time travel. If you're asking yourself, but wait a minute, if this wait is true, then isn't this true or that mm -hmm. if, if you're asking those questions, you failed. Yeah. That's as a, a writer. Well, and plus the, the, the leg, you know, the legacy, I'm just keep saying Star Trek legacy writing team, because I do feel like that's going to happen. But Picard season three writing team, the one things they, they had in common is they're all Star Trek fans. And, and I know there's a little bit of dottings of that in the current writers' rooms, but what was key was that Terry was not only a huge Star Trek fan, but he was a, you know, he, in, he insisted that everything made sense and followed, uh, you know, followed the, the Star Trek lore properly as a fan. And I think that's what's missing from Strange New Worlds is, is I understand that they're trying to get, you know, this younger audience base and they're trying to tell the story of these characters. But there, there is this thing that's missing, and it's like the, the true understanding of what Star Trek's basis is does not seem to be coming through in Strange New Worlds. And it feels very, even though it's better that way better than Star Trek Discovery, in my opinion, um, it, it is it could it is Star Trek light. <laughs> right, that's true. Well, it no, is Star it, Trek light to me. It is too, and the people that you know, the people don't. The crew does not talk to each other. Like there's a, there's some there's been some good moments like. Uh, it's so funny. I, I really like Leon. 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 Mm -hmm. I, I think Christina Chen, Chong yeah. Chen, is yeah. great. I just hate the fact that it, why why is it why is she a descendant of Khan Noonie and Singh? Why why did you have to no. do why not create a brand new character? And you know, I really I, I, I really object to the fact that half of the crew, half of our principal actors are characters taken from the original series. This show is an attempt to completely rewrite and dispense with the original series none of the people who are watching to capitalize the show, on it mm -hmm. i think they want to i think they just want to erase it i think mm -hmm. that that it's like what disney did when they took over star wars let's not do, we have to have the legacy characters but really let's put r2d2 under a tarp so we can have mm -hmm. bb8 right. let's have the millennium falcon have a rectangular dish instead of a circular dish that's our millennium falcon c3po has a red arm the, the, the so but we need a bunch of brand new characters See, and you it's, haven't seen episode six yet, but uh, there is a moment. They actually have a moment where it's Spock, Kirk, and Uhura sitting at the same table together. Yeah, and, well, that's uh, but but see, that's just this cheeky, it's it right. lip service or whatever, and and that's fine. I mean, it's 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 fine that they're they're going to do that because oh, I could see them after Strange New Worlds is over, they're just going to go do Star Trek. Right. We, well, we already talked about that too. We think that yeah. the only way that they could, you know. If they're going to do it, and we pray to God that they don't piggyback on any TOS episodes and try to, you know, f go in between the episodes and do things, because if they if they redo the episodes, that would really really be terrible. Well, I mean, you know, like what they did to Balance of Terror again, yeah. a fundamental misunderstanding of of the Romulans. And Balance yeah. of Terror was the first time we saw the Romulans, and and it was so the interplay on that Romulan ship was adult. It was philosophical. It was compelling to watch. And when they went back and 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 redid Balance of Terror, the thing that they did the worst was the relationship between the Romulan commander and his centurion, mm. who, who sold him down the river, because they had so, to do something different. So what you're and, saying is, if we see any Romulans this season, um, in in our current timeline, then that would be messing up the TOS timeline. <laughs> are, are you not true? Because that's the first time they see Romulans, right? Uh, yeah. Oh, I mean, you know, it's and and again, again, it's just I, I mean, you know, it depends if your camera's good enough what you might be able to take a picture of. <laughs> right. Oh, wait, if you're actually you. I mean, it's it. Oh, that's I hated all that. That episode three. Yeah. yeah. I mean, everyone's probably <laughs> angry. Just wanting me to go home now. No, no, um, no. It's you know, you've you've we were trying to explain it before. Like, it's very hard to have loved Star Trek your whole life and to have this idea of how an how smart and intellectual and how deep Star Trek is and what it does for you. And then to, to have somebody come in and go, we can do that. And then they, they produce something that's like, you can see the shades of Star Trek there. You can see what they're trying to do, but it's like, there's just the synapses aren't firing completely. 
to be able to give you that experience. I, I want to ask you, so the very first episode is a Spock central episode, centered episode. Um, and uh, he ends up, um, he ends up in command, let's say for the first time. Which again, uh, I thought that was dumb, but okay. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So I was going to ask, what did you think of this, of, of what they did with Spock in that episode and kind of, well, uh, again, it, it's like, okay, we're now going to take these characters that have been around 57 years and we're going to decide that we're going to give them all these first moments to define them all. Mm. So, so we're going to be the ones to say this about Spock. First of all, when they appropriated Spock in the first place, I knew we were in trouble because all they've done is they've they and this is the, this is the biggest example of it. They're trying to define Spock themselves. And and all of that definition will now override what Leonard Nimoy and the original characters did in the three episodes, three seasons of the original series in the 60s because nobody cares about the 60s. It's right. old. You know, this is we're talking this is Star Trek turns 57 in September. You know. Wow. And um, it turns 57 years old. Who cares about the original series in the 60s? No, half the people that watch, most of the people that watch this show weren't even born then anyway, so who cares? Yeah, true. So, so and and I, I am willing to bet if, if I, dollars to donuts, I mean, Kirsten Beyer is different, but how many of these writers have even watched all 79 episodes of the original series? None of them, probably. I'll bet none of them have. Right. And uh, they've, yeah. they, they, they'll they read a BuzzFeed article, the 10 best episodes of the original series, you know, or they'll hear the essential Romulan episodes you need to watch. And then somebody will go and do some homework and watch it. But the, here, you know, it was really interesting. I was watching something, uh, uh, Paul Chato. I don't know if you know, but, yeah. he, but yeah, he we said know something. Paul. Call me Chato. Call me Chato. He did something really, he said something really interesting that never occurred to me about being a geek. And what he said was, if you're a geek about whatever, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, Star Trek, it's a good bet that your interests are not just Star Trek, but a whole panoply of, of stuff that, whether it's astronomy, whether it's music, whether it's fashion, whether it's shows, being a geek means you have a wide variety of interests. And they all, and, and one of the, the reason you're predisposed to liking Lord of the Rings or Star Trek or something is because you have a broad spectrum of interest in a lot of different things that lead you to liking this stuff. So you, you don't just know about Star Trek. You know about a lot of things. You might know about science and mathematics. You might know history. You might know a lot of stuff. So in order to be a great writer of genre material, you also have to come from a position of interest or a wide range of knowledge in a lot mm. of things. And I feel that... <clears throat> This show does not, I don't get that from the writers. I, everything feels, I feel like I'm watching a very specific, um, that, okay, it's seen, we're, we're, we're writing these scenes, but the scenes that aren't, that don't have anything to do with the Star Trek universe all feel very generic to me mm. when all the characters are talking to each other. Like you never, you never get a moment like in the original Balance of Terror when Kirk is in his cabin musing, why me? Because yeah. what the Enterprise does is going to prevent a war or not. And McCoy comes out with that great speech where he says, you know, in this galaxy, there's a mathematical probability of mm -hmm. one million million Earth type planets. And in all of that, yeah. and perhaps more, there's only one of each of us. Yeah. Don't destroy the one named Kirk. And it's a oh. great moment. No one talks like that on these shows. It's all this generic people interplay it feels like generic tv writing whether you're whatever show you're writing on and that's and the key. so it, yeah. it, it's generic just it, writing. it's generic the writing is yeah. very generic and when the characters are talking there you, you i don't feel like when leonard nimoy when they put words in spock's mouth it, you always knew it was coming from spock mm -hmm. with ethan peck he's got a certain cadence but they're right. not necessarily writing always to spock he doesn't have witticisms. I mean, he kind of did, like, in that courtroom episode, he actually makes a joke. But right. it's a serious it's a serious joke. But he's making a point. I actually didn't like that scene, but yeah. But, but I mean, I, I thought the joke was dumb, to be honest. Yeah. But at least he made a joke, you know? Um, just Spock wouldn't do that on this. He, I just, you know, in that serious moment, I just felt like his character shouldn't do that. No. But, I mean, I struggle with the whole, I mean, this entire season you know through six i can't wait for you to see episode five 
I really, really want to kick my brother's butt because I, I really wanted you to It was in there. It was in there, and I killed myself <laughs> to get it all in there last well, night. I don't think but, it was in there last night. You said it was in there this morning. Because last night I was watching, dude. I was watching until late. No, I did. I messaged you. No, I messaged anyway, you. I was like, uh, anyways, uh, I, when you do get a I chance to see episode you the picture, five, I've talked I, so long, I can watch it while we're live and then we're, comment on it. Or well, you we, want me to do a live chat and just be like, I don't know. I don't actually, know if, if, you, if you can, if you have I messaged you there, at 2 but, in the morning, yeah. everything was in there. I saw a picture of it. 2 in the there. morning. <laughs> <laughs> Rob sleeps until the crack of show begin. You need yeah, to, no, oh, no. Do you I, really? Um, oh, I, no, I, I thought you were like me. No, I was up watching. No, no I, the whole yeah, but I I definitely want you to see because here's my thing about Strange New Worlds and Spock and and I, I what I love about Spock what everybody loves about Spock what every fan of Star Trek loves about Spock is that he's a logical being trying to become like you said earlier the the you know he's trying to prove his Vulcan Vulcanism or being a Vulcan every step of the way because he's half human and that's and, the thing he has to be the best Vulcan because. He would have it no other way. That's the great thing about Spock, is that right. despite the fact that he's half human, despite the fact that half of his civilization looks down on him, and the fact that his father, mm. you know, he's defied his father, and the fact that he wants, he does want his father to like him. You know, mm -hmm. he respects his father, but the the uh, the fact is, he has to be the best Vulcan because he has to prove why he left Vulcan and didn't go to the science academy and join starfleet and said if he's not the best of the best that ever lived he will let himself and he will let his people down yes and so this is what's missing from strange new world see spock needs to be that character and even if there was some growth let's say we had some you know him trying to figure out how to be that better vulcan it, through two seasons and so far what i've seen i haven't seen that growth and it feels like the character, they're just trying to capitalize on the fact of this, you know, of using as much of Spock's emotion as they possibly can. What made Spock great was not when he was being emotional. What made him great is that we could depend on every damn thing he said as being as close to the truth and a fact as humanly possible. And that's what I love about that character. And this character is missing. There is not the confidence. When Spock does something in Strange New Worlds, you don't go, that's the fucking answer, right? That's not, that's not it. You go, does he know what he's doing? And that I hate that about that character because Spock has always been the, the, the North pointing, you know, the, the, the North light, the, 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 where the compass goes, you can trust what he tells you as being something that's going to get pretty damn close to the solution of what you need. And I haven't seen that once in Strange New Worlds. No. And, and the fact that he doesn't know things and the fact that that's why I was, would say that, that, um, and first of all, you know, when, when they say, okay, Spock, you're sitting in the center seat, what's your thing? Mm. what Spock hasn't been around enough to know that all captains first of all that was such a weird it's such a weird thing that they've turned that into this buzzword but Spock would know mm -hmm. that as a matter of fact Spock would have something in play he would have already thought about he mm. needed his own imprintur to take command of the Enterprise and he would know that his crew expected him to say something and right. that's why I'd say he would know not only would he know what to say he would already have something that was way cool Right. That he knows he knows would be uniquely him, mm -hmm. and it would also be awesome, right? And he would have secretly been very proud of that fact, of course, on the underneath, and we would have only seen a glimmer of that feeling from him. Yep, and um, it's frustrating. It, it's frustrating to to not have that because the, it, it, we're 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 seeing at every step of the way we're seeing handicapped Spock. Who doesn't? Mm. He's he's right. saddled with a learning disability. He's saddled with, I mean, literally something's wrong with his ability to control his emotions or all. And I'm like, why? Because it's easier to write a character that has flaws. I mean, come on, yes. everyone has to have a traumatic backstory, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, I was almost eaten by the Gorn and my <laughs> relatives, Khan, Nooney, and Singh. Everybody hates me. I'm going to go away for a while because I'm so and, fucking depressed. And no one <laughs> wants to accept that I want to be a starship and not a not a person. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I mean, it, it's just, it's so, I hate it. It's so, again, that's another thing. Every character has some traumatic backstory mm. because they don't know how to write a character that doesn't because they're all in therapy themselves. You know, <laughs> and it, it, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, you, it's so weird because you, 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 look, 
I've met a lot of t- I know a lot of TV writers and I love a lot of them. But man, uh, there, if there's one profession that gives you uh, a, an immediate opportunity to bitch and moan and complain about the workplace, TV writers are your people. Yeah, I've never met a happy TV writer in my life. Chris Ever. Monfett's pretty happy. He's yeah. a pretty happy. You know what? That's not true. You're right. Chris <laughs> Monfett's pretty happy, and and um, and yeah, you know, they 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 were the 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 Picard writers were happy. Yeah. And because that's a reflection of Terry, probably. Yeah, that's that's. But but is Terry happy? <laughs> you be know, happy if they give him another show. Yeah, they'll, yeah, they should give him another show. But yeah, I mean, I I do think that that the way that Spock and and why, you know, you you never and what was really interesting, is, Spock is in command in the Galileo Seven. Mm. Now there is right. that's a first season Star Trek episode. Mm-hmm. There is an episode where, Spock is not compromised. He knows what's going on and he's trying to use logic and he realizes logic isn't enough. Right. And people get killed. And, and, and then in the end, when he makes that, that, um, that decision, he makes a hail Mary pass and they survive that. If you want to watch a a show about Spock being command, that's the episode to watch because it's smartly written. Yeah. And, and the thing is, it's it's Spock. the The reason that Spock is compromised is not because he's 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 just he's it's his lack of experience, and it's his you can't just use logic to be a great captain. Yeah, he and that's, learns that in that episode. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and that was that's a very legit episode um, of Star Trek dealing with and, Spock and, and having him learn weird, something. And what's weird is it, it, this is what screws up the show. So having him learn that in TOS. He would have already learned it as he learned his emotions in with Pike. So in these episodes we're seeing where he's experiencing those things, it makes that that TOS episode where he's he's the captain or where he's got command less less because he should have already experienced that. He should well, have already understood that. They're trying to overwrite TOS. Yeah, I mean that's that's the, that's what they want to do. Why and you know they don't understand why is the Star Trek merchandise that still sells still from the original series. Why doesn't Discovery merchandise sell? Because those characters, the characters that they are writing, I mean, people love Anson Mount, not because of Pike. They love Mm. Anson Mount, you know, and and he was the only person that felt like a a real Star Trek of Star Star Trek character in Discovery because he's this this handsome guy with beautiful looks. And he he he, the way he the the cadence of his voice, he's convicted and you believe him. Yeah. But but the reason that none of the other characters really register is because like let me add when you're a kid, I mean, I would say Leon um is a great character, even yeah, though she's Con like Noonan. Why does she have to be Con Noonan Singh's relative and why does she have to have escaped a Gorn breeding facility? Yeah, because you know, uh, yeah, they're trying to make these little connections because they think it makes the show better. They think they're making us happy. This is what's what's irritating about it. They think they're making us happy by doing this. I believe that's the case because there's no reason to even introduce those elements for the younger generation because they don't have a shit. What they don't know what happened on TOS. Only we do. Right. So you know, so it's funny because they're like trying to pander to us, but they don't understand that that's not the that's not the pandering that we want. We want we want it to be written smartly. We don't want you to affect the changes of canon or to you know we want you to complement canon, make canon better, and, um, and also tell it tell us really interesting, compelling science fiction stories. Yeah, you know that's absolutely. that's that's what any all anybody wants. All we want as fans are great new science fiction stories, and all of these stories try and I mean even even their even their okay even their yesterday's Enterprise mm-hmm. the third episode makes sweeping changes to Earth's backstory, mm. sweeping changes. That that literally puts the entire history of Star Trek's Earth into question. That that have never been dealt with again. I mean, they've just come right out and said, uh, "There's things happening on Earth right now that had never been established before that make a lot of what we already know about Star Trek for 57 years uh, a, a, a lot different." That's and, a good point. That's well said. You, you, you just, know, you, you went through the the eye there nicely. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and and I was like shocked by it. Well, I, mm-hmm. I'm watching this this show, and I'm thinking, wow, they have just trashed 57 years of Star Trek history in this episode mm-hmm. without understanding. I don't. And, and the thing is, 
I I don't think they got it. I don't think the I think it was written by I think it was written by one I think it was written by one person. But Akiva Goldsman, I think Akiva Gold Akiva Goldsman and and uh Henry the two showrunners ran yeah. they wrote the first episode. And then 2, 3 and 4 were, were uh, written by others. But mm. I that that time travel episode I'm just like I don't think you what you I mean our canonistas or backgrounders are going to have a field day with that one. Yeah, because... that's going to be a tough one to explain. <laughs> no, it's, it's, I'm it, like... As nice as the story was in itself, and, and i got to tell you, the, the two episodes that I've seen that Kirk are in, he's in episode three and he's also in episode six. Episode three is a much better version of, of Kirk that Paul Wesley's playing. Let me ask you what you thought of his version of Kirk. Um, well, yeah. first of all, I don't, I don't believe him as Kirk. I think he's totally miscast. That said, I think he's a good actor. Okay. You know, um, I think he's a good actor. I don't think, I, I think he plays a fun character in episode three. Mm-hmm. I don't see him as as Kirk. What but, do you think? You know, missing? yeah. And and what's really what's really interesting is is um, it, they first of all they did something in the Orville, in as far as time travel is concerned, where one of the characters went back in time and lived mm-hmm. this life and had a wife and children. Mm-hmm. And in order to get things right, they had to wipe out that life. Yes. And and I thought that was a really fascinating approach to time travel. Right. Well, in this particular episode, um, I don't think they really paid much attention to what exactly happened as a result of this. Mm. You know, and, and it was just, eh, whatever. <laughs> so, yeah. It's fine. That's a good point, and it does impact Lon's character going forward. You know, it, the, she, you know, she's the only one who, who has any memory of what happened. Well, yeah, and 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 you know, you could say that that she literally was in a position where should I kill Hitler, right, or right. not? Yeah, nah, I'm not gonna kill him. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's very and, interesting. And, I mean, that is philosophical. Like, without the difficulties, you can't have the good, right? I mean, literally, saying. somebody's like, what if in the grandfather paradox, mm-hmm. what if we do that, but we make it literal? <clears throat> well, Stephen King did <clears throat> it. Whatever. In, uh, <laughs> yeah, Stephen King did it in, in the assassination of Kennedy when he did 11, 11 22. 22, yeah. Um, you know, 63. they actually save Kennedy, and then the war, he goes back, and the world's worse. Remember? Yeah. Oh yeah, so. no, because you can't. I mean, and, and that's another thing. That's that's you. You can't do it. You know, mm-hmm. you can't. So so dramatically, it's it's an inert. If you're going back and you're dealing with saving or getting rid of a historical figure, you can't save or get rid of them because you can't change the timeline because you'd cease to exist. Yes, because everything would be different moving forward. So when you re- get to that point. Unless you're going to deal with that and make that the central theme of your story, mm. you know, then I mean, and that's what they did such a wonderful job in City on the Edge of Forever of doing, you know, this one pivotal moment in time. Absolutely. OK, well, um, so I do want to ask you about episode four. You did see that one. So aside from the ripping off of, of, of <laughs> a other comic writers, book, um, what did you think of the idea of um, and we will say that um, uh, they do go to a planet that that is affects Pike's past in, in when that is canon because we've seen that in in the menagerie but what do you think of the idea because to me that episode felt like the most science fictiony um, because there was a different idea of something that's occurring that's impacting the crew um, you know the whole idea of of uh, and I, can't, I don't want to say too much about it because I don't want to ruin it but 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 you know you remember what what Pike has to go through with Mbanga and, and La'an and uh, what did you think of the whole did you think it was a good idea okay i think that idea could have been really interesting okay you know that was we've seen various various iterations of that idea in star trek before you know like who are we (laughs) kind of a thing we saw there's a great next generation episode it's a it's a it's a favorite you know ro laren and uh, maybe i'm the captain (laughs) you know it's they they i think that idea can be good what I don't understand is you have this one idea over here and then you have this other idea over here. I don't think they had anything to do with each other. <laughs> that, that's you know, a good point. It, it, it's like, point, it's yeah. like, where, where did this idea? Okay. I get it. 
we're going back to where we've been. Mm-hmm. Bad things happened. We're gonna go revisit this. That's that in itself is compelling. What's gonna happen okay. when where you're you have to go back to some place that it it, it 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 went bad. People died on your watch. Mm-hmm. You're going back there. That's, that's not idea. that's that's not an easy thing to deal with. Then you add this whole other. I don't know where that story came from. But this whole other thing, like let's put these two stories together. And then you're supposed to, you kind of have to deal with the ramifications of what went on here. But what does that have to do with what's going on? And I'm like, I don't know what this story is about anymore. Because mm. so because neither gets, one of them yeah. had anything to do with the other. Right, you know, that's true. You, they had nothing to do with each other at all. Right. And so there's this dilemma happening on the planet, and then it starts happening on the ship. But that doesn't have, uh, it's like, just beam everybody up and leave. Mm. What are they even doing there? Yeah, I don't. I I honestly don't know. I, I'm okay. like, I, that's a good point. I was watching the episode and I'm like, I don't. I have no idea what, why this is happening, and why why would you be affected in this way? And and they again, don't explain that, but they do. I do think the idea is very intriguing. It's something I haven't seen before, uh, especially in Star Trek. And if they had pulled that off right, I think it might have been. It might have had the potential to be good. I mean, here's the thing. If you're telling, you think about movies like Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Mm. You know, one one of the things about about modern Star Trek. I'll, I'll give you an example. Here's here's the difference between. I'm going to use Star Trek Five right here. I'm going to go in. I'm going to go deep into Star Trek Five. <laughs> what does Star Trek Five tell us? What does James T. Kirk tell the audience? What did Shatner tell the Star Trek audience? I need my pain. Mm. What I've gone through, I don't have a traumatic backstory that affects every part of my life. <laughs> I need my pain. The fact mm. that I survived whatever trauma I went through made me the person I am today. I'm stronger because of it. I'm more resilient. I'm a starship captain because of my pain. The mm. modern audiences, these modern writers, are all fucking obsessed with trauma. You know what? They are. They because are. the people that created Star Trek lived through world war fucking two mm. not only that think about that my grandmother died when she was 83 she was born in 1900 she lived through world war one she lived through the great depression she lived through the korean war she lived or pardon me she lived through the depression world war ii the korean war vietnam cultural upheaval the civil rights era the spanish she was 18 when the spanish influenza killed 50 million people you know we don't even know what trauma is today. Amen. And and it's Amen. like it's like we think it's time we for think, a new war. You know, we think a uh, 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 one a weekend long <clears throat> race riot is some kind of and it is not. That's not to take away from the stuff that goes on in our society, but cultural upheaval. The people that are writing Star Trek wanna. They, it, it's it's all one big therapy session. Right. If you want to be out on the final frontier and you want to be on a starship, you're over your trauma, man. Well, and that's what we've taught our society to do. So when you came back from World War II, people had shell shock. And you know how they dealt with it? You go home and and tough it out. Yeah. That was the way they dealt with it. Well, as time went on, they realized that after traumatic events, you know, we lost Rob. Um, (laughs) He's like, I'm out of here. I came in, uh, you know. I'll finish the thought. After World War II, you know, they people just had to go home and deal with it. And that wasn't the, the best way to deal with PTSD. So later on, when we started traumatic events, it was always about here's how you deal with your feelings. And this is how. So the people who are writing today, I mean, this is how they were raised. This is how culture has been, been kind of decided. And most of the writers, frankly, are young. You know, most of the writers are young right. writers. And it takes the responsibility of a, an Akiva Goldsman to be the showrunner that says, okay, well, you know, let's 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 set this down properly. I'm the showrunner, you know, and you have to be, you know, encourage your writers to write with a with a with a sense of history and and and, and what works for Star Trek. And I don't know. I mean, it could be that we're all screwed because, you know, <clears throat> it's funny. I was just at school the other day. My, my son was graduating uh, eighth grade. Right. Mm-hmm. And I had another I have another son who was getting out of the third grade. And they did this thing at his school where you know, all the parents showed up. And, and instead of like eighth grade graduating and having this really cool like ceremony just for eighth grade, the entire school graduates. Every class gets a special moment at the end of the year where they're celebrated to go into the next grade. And you've got all these parents and everybody's running through and they're clapping for all the kids. Uh, are the kids getting this 
And, and, and this is maybe what's happened to our young writers today. They're, they've grown up in the same environment, right? So as mm-hmm. my kids are today is like, I'm looking at them like, at what point in their lives does somebody actually tell them life isn't like this the whole way through? It isn't right. always going to be sunshine and rainbows up your ass. At some point, yeah. rubber's going to meet the road, and that's where shit gets interesting. All right, good to have you back, Mr. Robert. Yeah, I th- also, I'm, convinced, real quick. I'm convinced the writing staff of Star Trek shows is, is looking at my – somehow they're tied in with my internet whenever I start off with Star Trek rants. <laughs> they just start Somebody, de-dossing? Yeah, it's just like <laughs> – Demonetized. Yeah, they're, 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 just, they're, they're pinging Rob. Yeah, listen, uh, also the whole school thing where everyone gets an award or whatever, it takes so long as a parent. I'm sitting there and I'm watching like 100 people get their award and I'm just there for the six minutes my kids are going up there, but I gotta be a, I gotta be there for two hours, or I'm the dickhead. Just, just I hate it so much. Well, that, well, that sounds it, like you. It's it's it, it's such a terrible it's such a terrible uh, way to bring kids up. It is, you know, it it, it really is. I mean, and, and this idea, I mean, we 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 are taking away. Like when I was in school, the when I was in high school there was like an elite class. There was this class taught by a woman named Ruthie Newman and she taught the humanities block. And if you were in the humanities block, that was essentially for the best of the best intellects. Yeah. For, well, for my, for my school, it was called the Gates class. So, well, for me, I never did enough. I mean, my grade point average hovered between three, three and three, five. No, I, 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 really listen, I was on the other opposite. I was on the opposite end of that. I had to go to the, to the trailer in the back that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> where it was like, where like four kids were wearing helmets, and the special and this kids. woman, and the woman spoke very calmly and very slowly. Hello, Brian. <laughs> Hello. Well, I wasn't, I, I wasn't like, good I'm enough fine! to get. It. I, I was in, uh, I was in the gifted children's class in in in, uh, in junior high. I was also but, in the but, gifted children's class, <laughs> but I couldn't get into it when I was in high school, and I'm like, I was, it, it really annoyed me, but. All my but, class members had to have special hardware. <laughs> but the thing was, I I knew. I just hadn't done the schoolwork. You know, I was too busy going to movies or looking at enterprise blueprints in my spare time. You know, I wasn't, I didn't do the work and I knew I didn't do the work. And as much as I would have liked to have been in the humanities block, my senior year in high school, I would rather go out to movie premieres and I would rather go out. I had a job working at video stores and I was pursuing my own interests. So it choices. I knew, yeah, I knew it was my own fault, but I wasn't in humanities. Well, kids, they uh, don't know it's their own fault. And this That's is why you're stuck on YouTube now, and you're not, uh, you know, a professor at Stanford. Well, just I'm on YouTube though because I'm I'm making other things, you know, like a movie I made is coming out in Germany this summer. Yeah. Fun. So so it's it's a trade off, and the reason the reason the reason that I'm on YouTube is because I can have discussions with you gentlemen about something I've loved my entire life and monetize it, which is yes. Star Trek. That's right. I yeah. Mean, True that. And um, you know that uh, it's funny because I've spent more time in my life thinking reading studying the star trek franchise than anything else in the world <laughs> so yeah no and you've so, and you've been, you've you've uh, ingested a lot of content over and there, i've so. been able to get i've actually had three professional jobs one i was a paid star trek consultant for a while for viacom licensing <laughs> i worked on the star trek experience mm-hmm. uh for two years and for three years i made star trek documentaries for the next generation and enterprise blu-rays so I have gotten paid I've, uh, as a real professional and made stuff that you can buy and watch. I'm and so whatever. glad yeah, you so did the experience, that, Brian. I, I, whoa, whoa, no, I went. I wasn't yeah, criticizing him, telling him he should have been. He, no. We don't want no. Professor Rob. We want no. Critic Rob. Come I wasn't yeah. criticizing him. If he's happy, that's completely fine. I'm just saying, so had he not to gone to movies, you know, maybe he'd be more respected a uh, oh. member of society versus the pariah that he is today. <laughs> 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 well, no, but that there is an element of truth to that. People are always like, you know, I could have been more successful as a filmmaker or but I've made choices that I've it, it's weird because I've lived in a fan space and in a professional space and sort of balanced them out as opposed to being a really, really successful professional. Mm. But but the thing is, I've done what I, I've had a lot of fun. Right. I mean, I, that's what I would say about my life. And it's 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 choices. But the thing is, if I need to. You know, I can go work on on big movies or independent movies or whatever. And I like that, you know, but there's a lot of people that 
they're like, yeah, if you're so smart, why? And that's there's a there's a good point to be made there. If you know so much, why aren't you writing Star Trek? Mm. Well, I've never worked in TV. I'd never be able to become a TV writer. And if somebody like if a Terry Metalis got a a, um, a job like doing Star Trek Legacy, and he'd call me up and oh, Rob, I want you to come work on the show. I I would last about ten minutes in the Star Trek writers' room, and then I'd get tossed in my ass. I'd be the well, most annoying, the but hardest would, to but, work with. Well, you would try. And that's why you can't be a writer. So here, here's the thing is it's not about how great of a writer you are. See, there was a time when you could get a job writing for Star Trek because you were an incredible writer and your script right. could make it to somebody's desk and you could get picked up. There are so many guys out there right now. Very, very. Ron Moore. Guys who don't, wrote Ron the Moore bonding. One of them. Yep. You know, they read the bonding and suddenly, oh. It's yeah. It's not like Oprah. He you can be a Star Trek and... writer, and you can be a Star Trek writer, and you can be right. a Star Trek writer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he, uh, you know, he snuck in and dropped his stuff, his stuff uh, off the off the Universal backlot. But um, what's funny is nowadays you can't. You have to know somebody. You have to have you have to have you know certain level of ethnicity uh, in your in your back background. There's a rule to... at Paramount that uh, the writers' room and the cast on reality shows have to have a uh, percentage a certain percentage of people with a specific skin color or sexual orientation and it's weird when you when i saw that article i thought it was just like you know i thought it was just uh you know you know right wing uh, stuff and then no. i saw the last season of survivor and it is so true <laughs> well well what's you know and look i'm all i've always said i'm all of all about the more stories bring on the diversity of writers because mm. I want to hear stories I haven't heard before. So I'm right. all about, I'm all about having more diverse voices anywhere to tell me stories I haven't heard. Absolutely. And the problem is the, if you look at the demographics of how our society here in the United States breaks down, what people want now for inclusion and all that is way more people. If you compare the demographics so you're getting a much more skewed um uh they don't want like 13 percent six percent of certain kinds of people that are that are demographically true they want 25 percent or 50 percent right. and right. what happens is you know if you think about like let's say you're part of a marginalized or uh, a, a minority community in the united states say if you're i think black america is like 13 14 percent mm -hmm. of that of that demographic First of all, how many people are crazy enough to want to go to Hollywood in the first place? Very small. Very small. And of those people, how many people are good enough to even get into Hollywood, which is a horrible, awful, terrible place to go work. Right. And it's very, very difficult. So, so you know, that's a that small, infinitesimally small number. And it's really funny. People are like, well, you know, you have working in Hollywood. Nobody has privilege working in Hollywood. I've been working in Hollywood for 35 years. Nobody has privilege. Everyone gets punched in the face repeatedly over and over by a horrible system repeatedly. that doesn't care about you. <laughs> it's terrible. So, so, but, but the thing is what I want, I want great writers. I want storytellers I haven't heard from before telling me stories I haven't heard that reflect the, the, the different kinds of lives everybody leads. I think that's what leads to great writing. You know, and I mean, I liked reading stories uh, from writers that that had to me. Give me give me somebody who's not me. I don't want right. to see myself reflected in something. That's why I get so angry when like like I think one of the things that they've really done is I've really enjoyed seeing, even though it's been fleeting, Robert April, you know, the character right. of Robert April. He's been great. Yeah. Do I care that they swapped him from mm -hmm. the original series and made him a black man? I don't. Mm -hmm. I really like that actor and I would give him more. To do like for instance why does pike not have more of a relationship with april like if you're going to get right. rid of dr boyce why I, I love that relationship and it was there's a great moment i love this moment where pike was pouring drinks for them mm. you know and he doesn't accept the drink and walks out right takes off and i i was like i want more of that please more, mm -hmm. more of of adult interaction between military minded men, command structure veterans. That that that's what I that's where I I want to see Star Trek live. Right now, you know? now that's a good question because that's not where they're going. So what no. we do know of New Trek is that they don't want a military structured. In fact, I, and I won't spoil it, but in Episode Six, there is a moment where 
where uh, where Captain Pike says to someone, a very, very junior officer, um, that, um, you know, that they're his friend. And I remember thinking, there is no way that an ensign should ever be the captain's friend in no. any situation well, uh, that's, on that level. None of these people worked in the military, where the people that right. created Star Trek all came out of World War II. Exactly. I mean, it's analogous to the Navy. It always has been. It always would be. It always should be. And the fact is, if you're out on the final frontier, if you don't have military discipline on a ship, you're all going to die. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you're all going to die. If you don't know the command structure, and a captain cannot be looking at the ensign going, oh, my God, I got to do it. I got to help that guy. I got He's my friend. That's why they have military discipline. And when you undercut that, it, it ceases to be believable. Right. Right. You know, and you, you've been in the military, man. You know what that's like. You know, you're going to go pal around with your commanding officer. You're going to go hoist a few at the, at the officer's quarters when you're done on Friday night. Would never happen. It would he never was, happen. Yeah. yeah, you yeah lose imagine me, me telling my first sergeant, hey, we're friends. <laughs> he might physically assault me. <laughs> well, I mean, that's and, but that's what people want now. I mean, everybody mm-hmm. believes in a world where every kid gets a trophy, in a world where you if, if you 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 call people however they decide to be identified and they get to they get to feel good all the time you know in that kind of a world uh wait till the war comes and they're all gonna fucking die that's true they're all gonna die right and and that's coming so it'll it's okay society will get toughened up soon enough don't worry yeah the chinese are coming people the chinese are coming good luck fuckers (laughs) because i can tell you what the chinese aren't worried about how their kids feel i can promise you that right now no no and Um, and and look uh, we're getting our asses kicked academically i mean we can't the the chinese are not going to take over with guns man they're going to take over with uh they're just going to buy everything they're they're, they're going to buy us well they're going to buy us ten cents going to own paramount in like four years they're going to turn off our infrastructure first right and then where are we all going to be i hope you know that's what that's what's going to happen why is there no power well the chinese well because tencent owns it and uh All but right. So, so real Johnny, quick. everything's going to be okay no matter what. Don't worry. It's okay. If they come it, it, for you in your house. You'll be okay. So it, yeah. Hey, uh, Johnny, it's not Johnny. I now uh, identify as Ginny. Like, okay. Well, listen, the Chinese are here to kill you. Good luck, Ginny. Oh, yeah. really? <laughs> well, that's that's a, that's another thing. That's a luxury. People mm. don't understand. Like, if, right. if if we're now demanding that we're being called by our certain whatever identity you want to be called by, that's a luxury. That's a that's a, that's a great luxury item that people need to realize is a luxury Extreme item. luxury, yeah. It's it's one that you live in a world where you can even decide decide that about yourself because exactly. you're not focused on you're clearly not focused on what you're going to eat tomorrow survival. or where the, right. yeah, you're not focused on survival, you're not focused yeah. on and if you're focused on that, that means you're already living in the lap of luxury. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. That's going to go away soon enough. Yeah, real quick, before we go back to the topic, we do have some super chats. Yeah, go for it. I'm so sorry. I, I didn't realize how long it had been since we had read a super chat. And Robert left. <laughs> Rob's like, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm not here. Rebecca Spade says, "Con." <laughs> I agree, Rebecca. I agree. That was, must have been when we, when we were talking about uh, Leon Nunyan scene. That's it's it, right? Leon. Why can't Leon. you say Leon? It's Leon. Yeah, it's Leon. Leon, Leon whatever. You can Lady Con. Lady yeah, Con. And, and when is that going to happen? I mean, and that's another thing. I mean, she's got, that's like saying, I, I mean, I might have a little Cro Magnon DNA in me, but I'm not, I'm not worried about going full Cro Mag like in sliders. Right. I mean, yeah, I, I, like I said, I have Mongolian love DNA episode. in me, and uh, in no way do I want to take over the world. So why, why do you think this law, they've really reached down to this Laon thing and, and really doubled down on her, on just her torment of being. You know, a, a Newman sings. It's so well, what's stupid. Up with that? Like, there's nothing impacting her. Nobody's like, you know what I'm saying? Well, first of like, all, no one's seen Khan in 300 years. Right. The, think about, think about. Uh, let me ask all of you: If you're thinking about America 300 years ago, what was mm-hmm. happening? Yeah, we were independent. Uh, <laughs> no, that, know, 300 well, years ago is pre-independence. That's true. That's true. What was going on? Like we three to, years yeah. ago, we, and I'm taxation lost. <laughs> without representation, brother. That's what was happening. Okay, taxation without. But has it affected you? Do you do you do you wake up at night thinking about? Oh my God, I don't know if one day I'm going to be a bad person. Like <laughs> is ben, the, is ben Franklin going to throw the tea in the harbor? Oh no! <laughs> I mean, in this in this in this season of Star Trek, Leon is worried about this. 
Mm-hmm. There's even a conversation, you know, it doesn't mean it, 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 it this is this is another thing that I it kills me. It's like the misunderstanding of what a clone is. When I was watching Star Trek Nemesis and this idea that a clone would feel what Picard feels because they're because they share genetic material, that isn't how it works, man. Not <laughs> it's it's no. not you don't have some weird psychic connection. You don't feel no. what the other person feels. You're not yeah. twins. You're not twins. No. And you're just a it, genetic it, copy and it, it, it your your experiences are what shape your opinions, not and, not uh, not your and biology. And they they bring it up like they even have lawn. You know, I'm worried that one day I'm gonna you're, one day you're gonna what decide to take over a quarter of the of the world, <laughs> that you're you're a Sikh warrior and you're gonna use your genetic <laughs> Superman compatriots right, and take right, over. Right. Are you gonna go back to Earth and go take right. over uh, uh, Eurasia? What are you gonna do? Well, what yeah, do you yeah, think's gonna happen in season one too? Remember when she found out that uh, Una was uh, a Lutheran? Remember, she got mad at her, and she's like, when I was young, they all used to make fun of me. Augment, augment. I'm like, what? Augie, wait, it's Augie. Augment, <laughs> Augie. Mo-. Like, it's like, so like augments are the new, like, uh, you know, type of person that we're a racist toward for some reason. Well, they do. They they lean heavily into that in episode two of this yes, season. Yes, they do. They do. And they and leaned into it in season one, too. It's, it's, here's, here's, here's another thing that, that, also, I can't stand. And and by the way, this started with Enterprise season four, when they talk about augments and genetic engineering, even in deep augment. space, even in deep space nine. You know, getting into about genetic engineering. I got news for you, kids. Genetic engineering is the future. Everyone's going to be genetically engineered in the future. That's what's going to happen once yeah. we unlock things. It's going to make us better. And the reason that um, the reason that they didn't like genetic engineering in the past is because. As Spock said in Space Seed, superior ability breeds superior ambition. That's right. And what, what they're afraid of is not so much the genetic engineering. They're afraid of what happens when people have superpowers. It's like when Magneto's, when the X-Men, you've got homo sapiens and homo superior. Right. And Magneto's like, fuck these people. They persecute <laughs> us. Well, let's, let's take over the world. We're better than yeah. you. Um, and yeah. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. that's what they're worried about. So... You know, and that's another thing, thinly veiled allegory that's really ham fisted and stupid. Mm. Just like they turned in in Picard season uh, one, all the synths, the synths are we've we've made a robot slave class and they revolted. We must ban the synths. I mean, ban the synths and and, no arguments. And why are there only uh, homo sapien synths? Why aren't there any Andorian or Klingon synths? Why do Mm. they? And why are they only making synths like six feet tall? Why wouldn't you make like an (laughs) elephant synth or something that you could be? It's it's because in Picard season one, all they did was copy paste everything, just like they did with their their starships. I gotta be honest though, with (laughs) synths, it would make more sense if they were like like three Mm. foot tall with large hands. And they can really get a lot of things, a lot of things done. They don't yeah. have, they, they shouldn't look like us. We're, we're, when it comes to like fixing things, we're not as efficient as a very tiny person with large hands would be. Or look at those little droids that come out now and fix starships on their little wheels and stuff. Like, mm-hmm. why would you? Right. Well, I mean, human beings are not exactly our structure. Our ambulatory structure right. is not exactly the one that I would copy if I was going to make a bunch of a slave race of things yeah. to fix stuff. Yeah, certainly not. Yeah. I mean, I'd and, make and it for why, sex. Why five fingers? And, well, yeah, for uh, sex, sex, sex robots, sure. you know, a pleasure model, like a, like a, I'd like, yeah. I'd like my Daryl Hannah pleasure model, please. <laughs> you know, but only from Splash. No, no, I want, I want uh, the female version of Data, specifically with the yellow eyes, fully functional, fully functional, <laughs> uh, in many forms of pleasuring, in many forms, yes, yeah, I like that one, uh, I like that. I mean, half of us are having sex with robots now as it is, or at least robotic mm. devices. Ooh. I'm kidding. I wasn't talking about me. <laughs> um, half of us on the panel, no. or <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, come on. It's all if you could have if you could have a synth that looked exactly like the most beautiful woman to you, or guy, like whatever, whatever it is that you wanted, or better yet, have have non-binary um um of synths that you could just all of your pleasures, any fantasies you had, they could work for you. Right. Yeah. You know, why yeah, to pring with a penis. All well, if that's what you want. Why? Why did not you do that? <laughs> I think you just. I think you just said, said to pring. Wow. I think you just said something about uh, about yourself that we didn't know. And then I oh. can upload all the the best ways to pleasure, and you know, just walk we're, away. By the way, we 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 will have that within twenty five years. 
100 percent 100 percent already well, have we, stuff like we, that we, we will. i thought we'd I mean, have it already to be honest with you we already have something like that it's 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 well, real was, creepy but what was the movie that, that came out it was like something 2000 it was it came out like 30 years ago and it was all about the future you know dystopian future but they had you know sex robots i can't right. i gotta look up what that movie was but it was they they i figured it would be here by now what where are they at well, man, there was a well, there was a you movie. Can buy, you know, if, if you can, I mean, it's it, the, the the thing that you'd want those they they'd have mm-hmm. to they'd have to be skilled. They'd have to have you know it's, you'd have to have sentient. But it didn't make it's just again it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> there was a movie with Bruce Bruce Willis where he played uh, it was a it was a society replicas. where replicas. Yes, replicas. Thank you. That's based yeah, on a comic book. That's I think I feel like that's where that's what we'll start. We'll start with a place where like our human minds are controlling whatever you know. Like, like right now, like imagine people who want to be something else or look something look like something else or whatever, they can just get in a replica and live their lives that way. You know? I mean, it's already too much of a pain in the ass to have a relationship with a woman. That's why I have an OnlyFans account. <laughs> <laughs> we don't even want to touch anymore. We just want to look. <laughs> look, but don't touch. You can't touch anymore. Touch. Rob, don't Rob, taste. Rob's girlfriend made a private OnlyFans account just for him. <laughs> Yeah, I sit in the garage and she's up there working. You know, I pay her. I, I, I pay her money. I log in. I'm okay. Okay, here's yeah. what I want you to do. I can watch. Hey, let's. I want to see you make me a sandwich. <laughs> do it slow. Put the mayonnaise on. Do it there slow. You yeah, no, no, no. Slower. <laughs> More mayonnaise, please. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we got a super chat from Son of John. Regarding the mechanics of time travel story writing, Albert Einstein's famous quote, if you can't explain it simply, you, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Have you guys seen The Flash? I have. Uh, yeah. uh, t- tomorrow night. There's a great I, explanation. I saw, I saw a crappy version of it, and I'm seeing uh, the yeah, IMAX version tomorrow night. Um, so, uh, I love the explanation of time travel using oh, spaghetti. Oh, with the spaghetti? Oh, yeah. That's great. That's great. That's great. <laughs> It's, it feels like a. It feels like that scene should have been in Back to the Future. Yeah, well, the movie anyway. has the Flash has a Back to the Future feel to it in terms of its tone. Yeah, it's almost like you know uh, whoever. I'm I'm not even sure 100 percent who totally wrote that thing. I know there's a writer, but it was it passed between so many hands. I have no idea, and I feel like whatever the final product is really understood. Uh, time travel and it, it helped the audience understand time travel and exactly what was changing and a lot of time travel shows and movies just don't do that and so it's frustrating as a as a as a viewer where i'm sitting there trying to make make sense of what i just watched and then i just have to sort of give up I'm like oh it just doesn't make sense like obviously writers or directors whoever was in charge left things out and i have to like fill in the blanks and that's the worst way to be as a viewer well, yeah so. And, and you know that's why I like tw- the Twelve Monkeys show does a really great job with time travel. Yes, um, really, really good. So the dystopian movie I was talking about was Cherry Two Thousand. Oh Melanie yeah, Griffith. That's directed the, the by sex Steve robot. Steve DeJarnett. Yes, you're right, Steve. Who DeJarnett. directed yeah. Who directed Miracle Mile and an episode of the X Files with an elephant in it? Dude, I'm sorry, there were sex you, robots. You, in you this? know everything, Rob. I swear to God. Just, off, I mean, it's it's kill. It's amazing how you know all this stuff. Lawrence Fishburne is in the movie. Brian yeah. James. Yeah, it's, Shane. It's, there were uh, sex pretty... robots in this movie. Yeah, I know you'll be watching it later. I'll send you the link. Um, yeah. Okay. Nice. No, but that's that's what you know. We're all. It's all going to go that way. I mean, yeah. it, relationships are hard enough. <clears throat> well, you guys can't do anything now, anyways. I mean, imagine approaching a woman. And thinking, well, I think she might like me, and then you do the wrong thing, and all of a sudden you're a you're a creep. You get me too. <laughs> I want a holographic Ana de Armas like in Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Oh my god! <laughs> I, I bought the six scale action figure of her from Blade Runner twenty forty nine, but she she is so unbelievably beautiful; it's insane. Like she yes. is. Like there are just some actresses right now that are just like mind blowingly hot. All right. Uh, Speaking of beautiful people, really quick before you do that. In Star Trek Strange New Worlds, I will say everybody's gorgeous. Everyone. Even Spock's mom is super damn hot. Oh my hot. god, Spock's oh. mom. As you'll is see super in episode hot. five. Super yeah. hot. I'm like, wait a second. Has, can that be Spock's mom? That's not possible. Yeah, she's super hot. Like they're all everyone's everyone's so attractive. Like yeah. so I, I, I so I'll tell you this. I about a year ago I said, look, if you're not gonna make good TV, at the very least, <laughs> populate it with good looking people. Okay. Because I'm so tired of watching these really crappy shows that also 
have nothing but ugly people in them. I'm like, look, I'm ugly. I don't want to look at other ugly people. So I think someone heard that live stream. They're like, look, we don't really got to make a good show. We just got to make sure the actors are really hot and Brian will like it. And it works. I can still watch it. I'm still turning on every episode. Even if I didn't like the previous episode, I'm like, yeah, everyone's hot. I'm cool with that. Well, plus to bring. <laughs> and, and she's smoking hot in this show. Smoking hot. It, it is. Like, it is disturbing. Wow. But, but I have to say, uh, and I can't pronounce her name, but uh, Yatide Badaki, Yatide Badaki, who she plays the prosecuting attorney oh, yeah, in, yeah. in uh, Strange New Worlds. Um, she's smoking hot. Yeah, she's and she's. she's hot I think she's from Nigeria. She was mm. smoking hot in American Gods. Yeah, yeah. And it's and weird. She, like, even, I, like I, the, I, even like the uh, the judge or whatever. I'm like, that's a good looking older woman. Oh yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, you, you, is it Yati? You tidy? You tidy? Badaki? She's. I, I mean, and she's a great. And I, this is my Star Trek. My Star Trek. My new dream Star Trek spinoff show. If they don't make Star Trek Legacy. Is I want her character, and I forget the name of her character, uh, to team up with Sam Samuel Cogley. They've done a Star Trek legal thriller. They've talked about doing something like that. I would totally watch that show. Can you imagine? I would. I mean, yeah. uh, treaty negotiations with alien races, biotechnology. They could do so many interesting things with a Star Trek, um, not necessarily JAG Corps, but an, a full-on legal drama in space. Right. Mm. You know? Yeah. And dealing with dealing with disputes. I mean, can you imagine like she's going to Sherman's planet? Oh, you know, gosh. how do you vote vote Sarek a Vulcan? You know, and it would be it'd be awesome. Yeah, that Treats would actually be cool. And plus you'd get to expand, you know, you get to learn a lot more about the universe. And it it'd probably be a pretty cheap show. The practice yeah. meets Star Trek. Yeah, I mean, and I would love that. And 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 think about all the think about all the really interesting like like what happens when like how does a what if a civilization wanted to have a treaty of its DNA or something, mm. Ooh, you know, or something, or or or, or something yeah. like that, or somebody wanted to. I mean, imagine what what they could do, and you yeah, had them teaming cool. up. So someone yeah. would have to play Samuel Cogley, um, and then uh, Yatide Badaki. As uh, long as they're hot, I don't care. I'm, I'm down to watch. Hey, well, from, it, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, say last, from last from wreck thing. thoughts, but go yeah, ahead. Go ahead. Well, the last thing I want to say about it is, so far in Strange New Worlds, the best episode, in my opinion, of both seasons has been a courtroom drama. Yep. And if you go back to TOS, one of the best se best episodes is a courtroom drama. And if you go to TNG, one of the best episodes is a courtroom drama. Let's go. Star Trek courtroom drama all the Star way. And, and yeah, the I thing thoroughly we disagree with you guys on this courtroom drama, but all right. it's okay. I would, I'm down to watch that, but I don't like this this episode you're talking about every you had you guys are gushing over yeah you, you, i didn't like it didn't yeah like it. you're not the you're not the, you're not the only one i was talking to people that think i'm crazy mark altman thinks i'm crazy for loving that episode yeah, but right. but i yeah. but i actually liked where what it was getting into it was just too didactic and it was too but it was still i thought it was uh, what Excellent what i liked that. about it was how it resolved itself and mm -hmm. i love when institutions like everyone's always trying to do the right thing but when you, you either have your institution that is if you have an institution that's unwavering and unbendable is intractable, I, I think that's always a great idea to how do you go up against something like that? Yes. And yeah, how they, do you ch how do you change that intractability? That's always an interesting story if it's well done. Yeah, but the the you know, the problem with that for me is that the the entire premise of the show is based on like a 2023 issue and it wasn't that's not true no no it that, is though it they're they're, they're, they're wrapping augments and and genetically modified people and they're treating them pretty much the same way <coughs> as we as we would have no. treated people back in the early 1900s it's the same story we've had for decades in every decade you know racism didn't start now it started you know also she ago. lied you know it, she lied and that was part of it too, right? Oh. But they, why? Why were there even? Why were Alorians even treated poorly in the first place? What by other Alorians, buddy. No, no, they were treated poorly by Federation people. Well, right, because of this story, because of Laon, because of Laon's great, 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 great grandfather. Yes, that's yeah, true. because of Khan, right? Because yeah. well, because of superior. That's what they're afraid of. But Still you know what's so funny? <laughs> is they need they need to explain that more. It's mm. it's 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 like, and I don't think. 
it's like Star Trek Into Darkness. Why was Benedict Cumberbatch playing a Sikh, you know, from from East India who took over a quarter of the world's population? I mean, a Sikh warrior. Um, he was playing a guy from who literally was from India. Mm-hmm. Why? And so when people are like, I am Khan, no one even knew who he was. They nice. never even established who the character was in that movie. Right. So who? <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like who they are you? assumed you knew. Yes, yeah, but even course. if they even if they knew, somebody would be like, "Well, he'd be like, I was expecting him to go. Well, you know, three hundred years ago on on Earth, well, Khan said in Wrath of Khan two hundred years ago, but on Earth two hundred, I was a prince with power over millions. You were mm. Wikipedia that guy. Hey, you shouldn't have left. That sounded like a good gig. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't have a choice. Though. Where'd you I go? Understand. Yeah, well, yeah, where'd you go? Well, well apparently. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's another thing that if you really think about this epi- this third episode in terms of time and where locations of things are supposed to be in certain mm. times, uh, it negated a whole thing that that needs to happen if you want. That's another thing that 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 episode completely the third episode completely negates Star Trek history that we are yeah. so very familiar right. of. Yeah, they do. You're right, and and I I did say something's wrong here, but I, yeah, I still funny. like I, that episode extremely. I, I liked it, but that isn't a problem. That is. A problem. And here's my deal. I, I I am now. I know you don't want to get behind this, but clearly this is a reboot. Hundred percent that there is a this is a different timeline, a different an alternate timeline, something, and we haven't figured it out yet. I have theories uh, changed, and from discovery. To now, we are we are in a, a completely different timeline. But I just really don't quickly, think they're clever enough to do that intentionally. It's only way it, it, the only way it counts as a different timeline is if it's done intentionally. And I just think that they've messed up, and now we can use it to like fix it. But I don't think it's you know what I'm saying. Some clever writer is going hopefully is going to add a couple pieces to the puzzle. To you know why though? You know why they're never going to do that because they think what they're making is better than what was before. Oh, that's harsh, man. But that's, that's what dumb. they think. Yeah. They that's they true. think. You're right. And when you read when you read the, the the articles about Strange New Worlds, people like Strange New Worlds today because it's their pop culture sense memory of what they thought Star Trek was. Mm. So, the to people watch Star Trek and all, and I'm talking about people from today. Yeah. Like if you're like 20 years old and you've never seen Star Trek before because you were born in 2002, like why or 2003? Why would you? Why would you grow up watching? Why would you watch the original series at all? You wouldn't. You know, yeah. you wouldn't because you'd be ten. You'd be ten years old in 2012, and you'd be watching Jurassic Park and The Matrix and all that. If you went back as a 20 year old, and I'm, I'm not. This is not an indictment of all 20 year olds, but if you no. went back and watched a show that came on, that was first on in 1966, right? <laughs> it would be extremely difficult to watch it, much less take it seriously. Yeah, it's true. Because of the way it looked, the colors they use. The, That's the, a fair argument. Yeah. The styles. I mean, and so you can't expect, as much as I sit there and bang on, and people send me that Simpsons meme, <laughs> old man shouting at clouds. <laughs> the, the thing is, I grew up with Star Trek. I was watching it since I was five years old. And this is true of everything. Like, like I think that anybody who's 25, 35, even 40, how far back do you go? Like, I'll, I'll, I'm a huge James Bond fan. Huge. I love the franchise. It is very difficult to watch Dr. No, even for me, as much as I love James Bond, uh, what going back and, and now you can, you can have that retro fun with it, Mm -hmm. but watching it as a movie, it really is glacially paced for a Bond film. It's got all these great moments in it. But if I were to tell somebody from, if I was trying to get, if I have a 16 year old nephew, and he comes to me and goes, Uncle Bob, you know, I want to watch a James Bond movie. What James Bond movie? I cannot in good conscience go, well, you got to start at the beginning, dude. You got to go back and watch Dr. No. Right. I, I wouldn't tell him that because he would watch Dr. No and be like, that kind of sucks. I hate this. Yeah, right. You know, and, and you've got to, <clears throat> and this is, this is something, by the way, I'm very aware of this. I, I'm very aware that you can't, you can't go back and watch. I mean, people see the Mugatu in a private little war. It's an ape suit with a, a, a a white ape with a, a horn on the head. Yes, right. people are, are, are going to laugh at that shit. It's you true. know, and it and cheesy. and yeah, because it's cheesy. But here's the thing: it wasn't when you were watching it, right? You know, and when, uh, right. and of the time too. Yeah, there was nothing else. So it was because of the way it was shot, and the music, and mm-hmm. the way it was edited. It was dangerous 
And, you know, mm. it took a chunk out of Kirk and he was like left wounded and bleeding. Right. You know, and you had that hot, the Canutu woman. And she had to come in Tyree's mm. woman and yeah, save him. Canuto. So they made you, and also it was a TV show, so it didn't have to be movie quality. Um, right. But mm. it, it made you mm. believe no one is going, and m- m- when you hear the word Mugatu, it's it's Will. It's 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 from uh, Zoolander. Mm. You know, it's Mugatu oh, yeah. is the is the is the fashionista. Yeah, and 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 with the Simpsons having parodied parodied anything that you can't, how can you watch stuff and take it seriously from the past if somebody's already right. done a It's difficult. Parody I'm making of it. my so, kids watch. Uh, I'm making my kids watch the original um, Planet of the Apes movies. Oh this God! Wow. Now, Sunday. now, what's really interesting about that is the opening oh. scene. You know, when you have. Charlton Heston saying, I leave the 20th century behind with no regrets. You know, does right, man right. still make war against his brother? And then when the ship crashes and you see Stuart, the woman who's a desiccated, mm-hmm. life forcing mummy of a, it immediately starts, even if you're a kid today, you're going to be like, oh, that's kind of yeah, hard. I'm hoping they grab, yeah, I'm hoping. You know, they grab and, yeah. and, and the, the tone mm-hmm. of that movie will keep you going. And there's that mystery going through the forbidden zone and in the beginning, mm-hmm. it, it still works. I hope I so. Think I'm, I, I'm going to make him watch it. So. Well, you guys didn't like the Mark Wahlberg version? What? Hell no. What? Well, where's the craft services? <laughs> <laughs> look, look, okay? Okay? <laughs> I can't do his voice. Let me talk to your mother for me. Let me talk um, to your mother. <laughs> you know, no, 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 no. No, I'm a no, human. But I, mean, I mean, I think so. So I'm keenly aware that watching, whether it's Discovery or Strange mm. New Worlds, I mean, think about it. Star Trek Discovery premiered six years ago. Mm. So if you were 10 years old, six years ago, you're, and you're driving now, Discovery might be your first Star Trek experience, and you might really love it. It's true. And so I can't sit there and go, because you're, you're part of the kid, every kid gets a trophy generation anyway. Right. So you'll love the backstory with trauma and, <laughs> and inclusion and Tilly and people that aren't exceptional, because we don't believe in a meritocracy anymore. And you don't have to be the best of the best. You can be Tilly and cry. Oh, well, maybe that's maybe they know something we don't. So maybe they're just no, they don't because the, because when the tsunami they ran out of chocolate ice cream. Ah! When the tsunami comes, they're gonna drown. They're gonna drown. Well, that's yeah. Survival's gonna be tough. That's for damn sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The other day I saw a um, I saw I, know, I think it was a TikTok or something. I'm not sure. Where some guy was like, I keep seeing all these TikToks about how you had to drink out of the hose. Why did you have to drink out of the hose? <laughs> You could have just yeah. gone right inside. And I'm like, no, oh my God. we would have died of thirst if we hadn't drank from the hose. You don't all get it. Was. That's uh, all there was. You know, you're not understanding. We weren't allowed inside. We had to stay outside. <laughs> oh. Why aren't we talking about Gen X? <laughs> I love that. I love that woman, that kind of pudgy, sexy woman. who's. <laughs> so let me tell you, we were free range kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, 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 I put up a uh, I put up a short of her on our Raw Ranch channel. It has like 30,000 views and like almost all the comments are obviously young people just like, she's not even funny, okay? (laughs) (laughs) She's awesome. I love her. I mean, you're watching it. I'm not (laughs) sure. I I love somebody who said the scalding Watt Hotter from the hose. Yes, if you tried to drink the water from the hose when the water first came out, you were going to burn your tongue. You had to wait a couple minutes for it to cool. Yeah, you had to wait. And and your mom would come out there. You're going to get an earwig if you drink out of that. (laughs) <laughs> we didn't care. We were. Thirsty. I don't know what an earwig is, but I'm really thirsty. Yeah. So, I, I, F it, I guess. Yeah, I also didn't wear shoes like ever. Okay, I drank out of the hose. I didn't wear shoes. I we tried wanted those calluses. We wanted I, those calluses. Yeah, I legitimately yeah. tried to see what the taste of tree bark would be if I added salt. I did that. Um, <laughs> Wasn't well, bad. That's how you ended up in those classes, buddy. <laughs> yeah, well, it wasn't bad. I I, I used to, I, I would go outside and I would be gone from like four in the morning until like 10 in the a.m. skating and playing hockey um, several miles away. And no one cared, really. All they cared about is if I didn't do my chores. It's a completely different world we live in. And to be frank, I'm a parent and I'm not letting my kids walk outside by themselves for sure. Well, they've terrified second. us all. Of course, they're going to steal our children as soon as we let yeah. them out on the street. You know, the <laughs> statistics actually don't bear that out. I know so. they don't at all. It's like we've they've they've gaslit us to the point of our uh, children yeah. are not safe outside. But then the conversations I overhear kids having, I'm like, oh my god, we're all doomed. <laughs> we're all doomed. I mean, they're I, all I, I get, our kids. But you know what though? I'll tell you something. 
the brutality that kids inflict on one another through online bullying and stuff. Mm. We never That's had any brutal. of that. That's Our kids true. are brutal. We yeah. were safe at home. We were safe once we got home. It's you know what yeah, else yeah. never happened? Game, but... You know what else yeah. happened? You know what I else was never chased happened? by kids on bikes, bro, because they wanted to. <laughs> They wanted they wanted the little chrome things that I had on my bike for your air 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 yeah that, that yeah that I got for Christmas and I had like a literally a pack of wild teenagers chasing me all the way home. This was like a con and this was a common thing. It was like it was like a Tuesday for me. I didn't even tell my parents about. It. I was like, you never told your parents. No, you, yeah, the you worst never told thing in the world anything. is if to have your mother or father go to school. Oh, right God. to yeah. talk to the principal yeah. i mean if your parents i'm like i'd come home with a bloody nose or a black eye or something and my mom's like who did that i'm like oh no, no i fell i fell yeah, i tripped i yeah. fell no, i wouldn't say you wouldn't you wouldn't yeah. say shit yeah yeah it's funny my, my cousin one time shot me uh in the back with a bb hurt like hell i had to i had to get my stepmom to help me pull it out right because like the little bb's still in there and she goes yeah who did this to you? I'm like, oh, it was me. I did. I actually, I was playing with the the. the, the, the just, <laughs> how did you shoot yourself in the back? I'm like, I don't know. Ricochet, it have, mom. It must have ricocheted off something. And she goes, what the? <laughs> <fuck?"> <laughs> um, right, real read quick. Read thoughts. Thoughts. Read Rec thoughts. From Rec thoughts. Thank you, Rec thoughts. And by the way, if you guys don't know who Rec thoughts is, this guy's legit. He made me, and I'm going to share with you if he's cool with it, uh, Rob. Too late. He he sent me. Huh? No, go ahead. I'm sorry. He, he sent me a, an eight-hour movie cut version of Picard Season 3. Mm, yes. Do you have two versions of it? What? Do you have two versions of it? Yeah, I mean, I have the I have the movie cut. No, but do you have the movie cut? There's two versions of the movie cut. Okay, hold up. We'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> but whatever it is, it was brilliant. Uh, I couldn't even find... Like, I'm, I'm an editor, and I, I had such a hard time finding the you edits. Wanna hear, you want to hear something funny about that? Huh. I sent it to Terry. Oh, oh you really? did? Terry and his editor started doing their own version of it. Oh. No. Yeah, because, no. because <laughs> Terry called me and he goes, he's like, now we're obsessed. You know, and <laughs> as Terry put it to me, he's like, they had to stop. Oh and and because Terry's like, well, you know, this is what he said to me. He goes, you know, if you lose Laris, he, he was very serious. He goes, if you lose Laris and when you cut to Picard, the music's not right. You know, mm. when you go directly to Picard and he's just sitting there, the cut from going from Beverly to Picard, which, by the way, it works, but the music's not the right mood then. He's right. got to change out the music. And I'm like, well, yeah, dude, but the editor didn't have access to your split audio right, channel, so right. he actually couldn't do that. Right. That's However, what I love about Terry, though, because he has this ability. He's obsessive about everything he does, even when it's pointless. I this love is, that This about is for him. Rec Thoughts. Uh, I saw the same thing, and I got to say, there is a way to get the, the stems if you are what if you are watching on Amazon, Amazon Prime, everything is 5.1. Oh, you, yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> you can capture the 5.1, okay? And I do this for our videos. You can capture the 5.1 and then left just and right stereo pairs. And music. just go for channel 3 and basically channel 3 is the, uh, is is vocals only. Yeah. And there's like a, and a couple little sound effects and you get vocals and then you can knock out the rest of the crap Actually, and just pick if you your own wanna stuff. Be, if you want to be specific about it, Center 3 is CTR. Right. Well, I'm talking about, I'm talking about when you yeah. capture it, it's, it's just Channel yeah, 3, but you're right. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, you guys, it, it, it works. It works. Um, and you can and you, you can do that, and you can even run it through uh, like like a, a, a software called Moses to completely kill any music under underlines. But, but, but anyway, but it was funny. Cause Terry, when I, cause I sent it to him and, and he was telling me that, and then fine, he goes, but I finally had to stop myself. I'm like, we don't have time. We can't go in and do our own edit. We'll keep this one. Whatever. <laughs> that's, that's great. So rec thought says I am behind the live part, but based on Rob's talking about them doing flashbacks in a dumb way, it sounds like I'm going to have to do another star Trek edit. <laughs> Yeah, it, it could use. They really need to remove flashbacks from ten minutes earlier in the episode. It's so dumb. Well, they did the right. same thing in episode six. Well, it's also, like, I, 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 we were arguing about this yesterday. I feel like one and two, those two episodes should be like flipped around. In and I know they can't be narratively, but like it doesn't. It it it's so jarring. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it's jarring the way the narrative set up. And then also in episode two, it's jarring. Like there's no establishing shots, Rob. So like it just goes from like oh, that's true yeah he's like on a planet and then he's in the kitchen and you're like what the f just happened no there it's clearly there there's 
Oh, I will say this though, I do appreciate their use of the volume stage. Like in episode four, when they're on Rigel Seven, mm-hmm. there there's some good volume stage use there. That's that giant 3D projecting yeah, the, the, thing. Yeah, yeah. The, but yeah, the... but, I, but I, I have to say, you're right. There's where's the there's a I think there's a few Starfleet Academy a Star, Starfleet a, there was an, one establishing shot that was pretty cool of where that building is, the mm-hmm. the courtroom or whatever. There but yeah. you're right. There's no they don't they don't. That <laughs> you're right. I mean that it was such a weird so so pike leaves in episode one they don't even show him leaving he, he, he takes off like, right. i gotta go i'm gonna go i'll be gone for three days and then right. he shows up on this planet in the beginning of episode two with that breathing apparatus right right you know, it's, it's like there was no no establishing shots and we can't talk about weird. this until next thursday but i gotta say like that 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 whole thing I'm going to talk to Rob about it afterwards. But next Thursday, I'm going to lose my mind on a certain topic that I, I just can't talk about right now on that <clears throat> on that episode. It just, it, I, never, I didn't understand it. But the establishing thought, the thoughts thing was the first thing that started me down the, the path of like sort of frustration because it just <sighs> jumped from location to location as like it made no sense. Yeah. But well, I did like, I, I did like, like, like you said, I, I did like the, the interior the production design of the courtroom and stuff like that mm. well, yeah let me ask rob the the elephant in the room <clears throat> pike's cooking <laughs> pike did a lot of cooking during season one and he's doing a lot of cooking in season two he's in that kitchen a lot and in fact in episode five he's teaching spock how to cook yeah the kitchen What's is pretty much a character cooking? at this point yeah Dude, that's that's how they're differentiating him. You know, mm. first of all, like as a as just you have how much how much time do you have? These episodes are like fifty two minutes. Mm-hmm. Okay, the original Star Trek was fifty two minutes. The episodes are fifty two minutes. Every time you're spending this is this is what these this is a lot of the writing having a these domestic moments like cooking takes away from your fifty two minutes of story. Right. And and I think I think because it's easier to write some domestic again a cooking scene can be in any show, right? And they think it's novel mm. that Pike's going to teach Spock how to cook. Why should Spock not know how to cook? I would think <laughs> that true. what would really be what would really be more mm. interesting is if Spock is showing Pike a dish to prepare, and mm. you find out that Spock is like Bobby fucking Flay. You know, I mean, He's like, <laughs> again, yeah, right. again, again. Why does Spock have to be marginalized everywhere? Mm. why does he have to be marginalized i mean it's you should see if if the show is cool which it isn't they they would pike would be in there cooking and and spock would be like if i may captain and spock should be be some fucking grill master with the knives and be like because spock would have studied these kinds of things yeah he's he not only would he study them he would be good at them you know, and and learning how to cook, learning how to cook uh, human cuisine, going to Starfleet, that would be part of 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 a, a basic human ritual that Spock would want to be a part of, right. and that would be rather than if Spock has to stand around. Well, what, what what's your thing, Spock? Oh, I don't know. I I don't know this tradition. Mm. You know why why do they they constantly marginalize Spock in this show? Spock was always a badass in yeah. the original series from day one. From day one, from one, day right. one. and That's in this show, he's a mar- he's marginalized, and the the show is he's a punching bag in a way. You know, he's always some guy, and, and then when he does come up with something, his thing was dumb. Mm. It was dumb. It wasn't even. It was not witty. It wasn't smart. It wasn't unique. It just makes him look like, dare I say it, developmentally disabled in some. I think way. he was. Per- I think it was perfect because Spock wouldn't participate in the thing but here's the thing he's being asked to by his crewmates and he would know that this is a ritual because it isn't really because they've made it one in modern star trek but if it is indeed a ritual and they've made it like it's a thing he would want to have his thing and it would be the best thing yeah it would also be the it would be the best thing to him and it would be something you know what if i had written the episode not only would have been cool Mm. but everyone everyone else would be like that was fucking cool right but instead they turn it into a joke and they marginalize spock yet again yeah and i hate that i'm stressed here have a fucking harp (laughs) i hated that 
I hated that so much. You're killing me. Somebody That's gives Spock a harp. Here, learn to play this. <laughs> I mean, there's literally there is. Li- can I just say this? I'm not. It's not <clears throat> spoiling anything. Yeah. Literally, Spock has got, gets a noise complaint. That's true. But a it noise, was from the person. A, a fucking it, noise complaint. It I don't... was from the person who, who who said they were complaining. It's so funny because Laon was like, it's from La- Laon. And La- Laon actually says there's a noise complaint. But you can tell it's her complaining about the noise. But he doesn't figure it out, which makes him look stupid. You're right. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the like, whole thing, it's, it's like, I, I, again, it's I, I hate this show. The people uh-huh. writing this show, they think they're really smart and witty. They are not. And that's what I can't stand. It's Akiva Goldsman itis. Uh, mm. You know, I, I, he adapted one book and got an Oscar, but he had to have the book to make the adaption from. I mean, so it's true. like it's not bruh. original. You're right. I mean, come on. If you're left to your own devices, mm. you'll always pick the stupid. If a keys, if a key, if a keys, Akiva Goldsman is going down the road of life, he's always going to choose the dumb road to travel. I want to see. The, the, I want to see the him. Uh... Road to travel. I want to see him with that trolley exercise that we did in college. Uh, which side uh, do you choose? The, the, the side with the baby <laughs> or the side with, you know. The elderly he's, woman. His, right. his mind just, his brain just explodes. He has an aneurysm on the table. Well, it's funny. Akiva's, the, <clears throat> Akiva's part of the, in, in, to give him a little bit of credit, uh, which, which coming from Rob, that didn't happen. But uh Honestly, with Discovery, when he came on board, he told Alex, he said, uh, well, we're, so we're going to do Pike, right? Because Akiva was a fan of TOS. I don't know what happened or why he oh, no, no. feel like he was. Did. I mean, he'll tell you he went to conventions. Mm-hmm. I, I really believe that Akiva Goldsman is a Star Trek fan. So what the... So, so is he just not... I mean, I don't know. I mean, it seems like it would be simple. We're all Star Trek fans, and we understand you know, what they should or shouldn't do. So I don't understand why he, why he has this issue um is he just not a good showrunner you think that's what the problem is i think he's uh, have you have you seen the reviews for the crowded room no another project of his <laughs> very interesting mm. i i think akiva goldsman is in the akiva goldsman business mm. and and that's okay i mean he's certainly got his hands in a lot of pies but yeah. when was the last time you ever thought of akiva goldsman here let's just do a thought experiment um okay on an imdb yes uh, let's see. Yeah, you know, Goldman. Hey, while you're doing to... that, I'm going to do a super chat. Okay, go ahead. From No Money G for $10. Thank you, No Money G, my man. He says, I'm suffering from major pain <clears throat> from the new Trek writers. <laughs> when we were talking about the emotional pain. <laughs> um, well, see, there you go. You, 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 you would fit perfectly on Star Trek. No money. I do think that there is a, um, there is a little bit of a spoutered, uh, a battered, spoutered, a battered spouse thing going on with fans and critics and Hollywood. Um, we've been disappointed for so long by, by so many things that even when something is good, a, there's a there's a wide swath of people who can't get behind it, who can't praise it, who can't give it any kind of love. They got to nitpick it to death, and then. An even wider swath of YouTubers that sort of do the same thing with thumbnails that are meant to sort of capture that negative spirit. And <laughs> some of these YouTubers, I haven't even watched the TV show or the movie. Picard season three, there are YouTubers that are friends of ours that made Picard season three videos, and they had they have still not seen Picard season three. Um, really? It's a weird, yeah, and it's a weird thing. Like, like oh, I just refuse to. Well, then why are you making videos about it, bro? Stop. So the thing is, like, like, I get it, but I think we're in this relationship with Hollywood that we can't get out of uh, or that we don't want to get out of. We, we want to think that we can repair our relationship with Hollywood, but in reality, a lot of us have already uh, shut that off and it's time to get a divorce, but we're holding on, so we're really making Hollywood suffer even when, we, even when they do good stuff. And it's, it's pretty crazy. Well, what did they do that was good? So, Case in I mean, point, The Flash. The Flash is a great movie, and I'm seeing nothing. Well, I, don't, I won't know till tomorrow. So. Picard, I, season, Picard season three, how many people, that even that we know, that gave it nothing but shit? Yeah, but the critics loved the people. You know, when the people who actually watched it, it, actually Picard season three is a misnomer because it was it was it was universally celebrated by most people. 
Uh, did you, you know what I thought was? Mm-hmm. By, by the way, if you look at Akiva Goldsman's credits, okay, mm-hmm. he started out writing the client. Yep. Time to Kill book adaptations. Yeah. Good. Batman book Forever ad- yeah, and true. Batman and Robin adaptations of a comic book. Lost yep. in Space TV adaptation. Practical yep. Magic book adaptation. Mm-hmm. A Beautiful Mind book adaptation. I Robot book adaptation. Cinderella Man Sin- book adaptation. Yep. Da Vinci Code book adaptation. I Am Legend Angels and Demons. Oh shit. <clears throat> he completely fucked up a Winner's Tale which he wrote and directed which is a phenomenal book that he completely screwed the pooch on that which was um, a damn shame because that book is amazing. And that movie probably destroyed anybody reading the book forever. Um, But he's mostly written adaptations. Um, Mm. Other than things like, oh, The Dark Tower, a book adaptation. and Which was terrible. Yeah, terrible. So most of what he's written is um, in a crowded room. Um, You know, he wrote three episodes of that, and it's not getting good. You know what he said, apparently? So the crowded room is based on a book called The Minds of Billy Pilgrim that um, James Cameron wanted to make for the longest time. It's literally about somebody with disassociative identity disorder. Oh, and really? He was telling critics not to reveal that information. It says in the opening titles that it's based on the book, The Minds of Billy Pilgrim. <laughs> if anyone knows anything about this, it's not like it's fucking Fight Club. Oh my God. You know, yeah. <clears throat> but so. Akiva Goldsman, and it makes sense then that you're looking that they're going to adapt comic books mm. or that they're taking backstory from Dorothy Fontana. Because that's what he's done. Because yeah. that's what he does. You know, yeah, and, and so it. and so that makes sense. It makes mm. sense to me. But but and that's the thing, unless he's adapting something, you know, he's not gonna come up. And and if you look at if you look at uh Strange New Worlds, there's very little originality in it in terms of story. That's why they fucking stole the Ursula K. Le Guin story, Those Who Walk mm. Away from Umlas, for the first season episode, which was a pretty good episode. I actually kind of liked that episode. I thought it was well executed mm-hmm. and well done. It had a monstrous conclusion that they didn't change. But they still stole that story. Mm. Steve Shives, is it Shives? Steve Shives, Steve who does Shives, this. Yeah. Steve Shives did a video. <clears throat> did he really? I felt there was mm. a personal affront, attack on me because I, I came out hard and said they did. Well, maybe they did. They fucking did. Yeah, and, it and, was. and it's like, give, give, give Ursula K. Le Guin credit. But that's what Akiva Goldsman's doing. You know, he's going mm. in and taking all this stuff and, and making it um, their own. But yeah, and I, I mean, I, and, and also it's been really interesting. Picard season three, I guess Jesse Gender, she did a whole 180 degrees on Picard season three and really? made yep. a really long takedown video of yeah, the show. Yeah, really? She Which loved, I'm like, she loved it until she didn't love it. Yep. Or or she was told not to love it. <clears throat> right. Which for various mm-hmm. reasons. Right. Interesting. <laughs> Which I, I have not watched this video, but I plan on going and doing so. Well, they're very upset about the whole Rafi and Seven thing being kind of torn down. <clears throat> and and uh, what does that have to do with anything? Not nothing. nothing. Yeah, There's I mean, but see, but see, this is the whole thing. Does that have to do with the story that's being told? And you know people break up, <laughs> and and it takes place a while later. You know, um, I'm really upset. You know, Laris is waiting at that bar. Where's <laughs> right, Picard? Right. They should have had yeah. a post script. You know, a post scene <laughs> yeah. where where you know Laris is waiting at that bar and somebody shows up there? and yeah, still sitting there. That'd be great. I would have had yeah, then, then some up. young Romulan comes in. He's like, and he's just smiling at her. Yeah, you know, something I, like that. I wanted to give Akiva some credit because I had heard Russell Crowe say that uh, he came in and redid um, and redid his uh, Gladiator, rewrote it because it was not well. But I don't even see it here in his credits, which is interesting. Yeah, I mean, he might have done that. that everyone wrote on that script. I mean, John <laughs> Logan, he's like That's true. Credited. Um, but yeah, I mean, look. I'm sure Akiva Goldsman's done a lot of a lot of good in the world, you know, his adaptations. I've liked some of the movies that he's adapted. Yeah, Beautiful Mind's a good movie. It is. And that, you know, he good. worked with he worked with Ron Howard a number of times because he's a good he, obviously mm-hmm. he can adapt things well. Mm-hmm. Um but you know, The Fifth Wave uh if you guys The Fifth Wave, it's a young adult like alien invasion story. The book was fucking incredible. The first book, really? the movie was not so much. Mm. Uh, really did. I was really disappointed. And a Winter's Tale, a Winter's Tale, dude. And well, I guess you could say Fringe was was original, sort I of. It was all yeah. over Fringe the place. Fringe was original, yeah. 
We're going to be talking about the Akiva Goldsman more tomorrow because apparently he signed our petition. So, oh, sign good. Your, sign your That's petition for Star about. Trek. Well, now he's talking about for Star now, Trek Legacy. Now he's talking about Star Trek Legacy. There's right. an article oh. was on Trek Movie or something. I you was, know what that means. We're, yeah, but you uh, watch watch them do Star Trek Legacy and freeze Terry out. No, no, they're not going to freeze him out. If if you go back and I, we haven't even talked about it since it, I don't know if we've talked about it, but um, if you go back and when they did the the IMD, not the IMD, the uh, oh I, yeah, the, IMAX the, screening the premiere, yeah, you can just yeah. Terry and I love you, Terry. I don't, I don't, if you're if you're watching this, but we know, bro, it's all good. Something's coming in the future. That he must promise something. Now they could screw him over because you know Hollywood is, but uh, as of as of now, I do think there's something coming for him. <laughs> so good, uh, from, good news for us. Good news for yeah, us. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, just from give me from Star No Trek. Money G. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, No Money G. He also said they don't know the source material, only grifting on surface knowledge with a little homework. It could be awesome. Frustrating mm. is is what it is. Well said, No Money G. Yeah, I mean, they just need to... God damn, go watch some shows. I mean, let just fans few, make it. I'll make a list of 20 science fiction novels you should read. Just yes. read those books and draw draw inspiration from them. Don't just rip them off. You know? I want that list, Rob. <laughs> he's gonna make a he's gonna Rob's gonna list. make a list, then we're gonna see projects start to pop up on IMDb where it's the exact title of the book. <laughs> I'm okay with that. It's funny. I'm not. I'm not. Yeah. What? Yeah, I want them to adapt good shit. You know, yeah, good but, writing. Yeah, but they're not gonna adapt it correctly. I I I, I recognize that. I tried to watch the foundation series and <laughs> it's beautifully made though. It's beautifully made. Slow. It's not a good series, though. Not a good series. I, I can't. I, and I and I lived and died by those books. Anyways, uh, next. Did they even up, read them? <laughs> did they even read those? Books? I don't know if they did. <laughs> it, it, it was almost unrecognizable, though. It was like the the story, the like the plot points. Nothing added up correctly. It's well, to be fair, awkward. though, that that's a that that's a tough book to uh, turn into a weekly drama. Well, okay, mm. yeah, um, but it's a. It's a series of books that you could have made uh, 10 seasons of TV with. Easily. That's true. All right. Anyways, I, I still want to see. I, even even with that said, I wouldn't mind them taking a crack at uh, 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 Detective Elijah and, uh, and Do Robots Dream of Electric Sheep. Mm. All right. Michael Nemo. Thank you, Michael Nemo. Also, by the way, Michael, uh, I effed up on Monday and you actually won the stream here. So... You need to contact us about that, so I can. Oh no, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna spin him tomorrow. So in the beginning of tomorrow's show, okay. we're gonna spin him. Remember, get oh, okay. Michael's Michael's correct about this though. Yeah, he says, but don't the writers want to use Una as the I've lived a li a life in secret, uh, inauthentically surrogate for being LGBT. Wait in a second. Times. Wait a second, Michael. Did you watch episode two? Because holy cow. Right there's a moment where they try to slip something in there. Which no, there's a moment say. where they get they get real 2023 with it, bro. It's like I'm watching the view for a second. No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a single cut of the camera, which made which left us with. You the mean an insert? There's a, there is an insert, insert yeah. shot that that everyone's going to yes. be screaming at. Oh my god! Yeah, that's right. true. Which they was, did that which, shit on purpose. Which was so overt. And you know what's really yeah. the bummer is. If you're gonna do that, give me that love scene. You do it. Yeah. Give me oh, yeah. that love scene. Yes. I mean, yes. if want, you want if in you, its entirety. Yeah. I, start yeah. to finish. Yeah, I want a bump. You you just got me off. Bump. Yeah. Chicka bump. Yeah. Wow. 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 I'm gonna watch it from the very beginning until they're both smoking cigarettes. That's Dude, what I want to Especially see. with the two of them shooting that, mm. you know, that that would be. Because you, you talk about the hotness. I mean, that would be a smoke and love scene to watch. Let me tell you. Yeah. Why don't we get? So, why don't we get that? Uh, and we haven't seen that for all of the for all of that that um, that stuff. Uh, give me some what I really want. Give me some of that. Give me some of that. And and right. uh, I want to watch this. That. Ain't Star Trek XXX. Listen, a super chat from Mo Sizlack is perfect for this exact moment. R and B discussing Trek and future sex robots. LOL, you are my hero. Well, thank you. I mean, remember, the sex robots go all the way back to the second episode of Next Generation, The Naked Now. I mean, uh, and, and they went oh, what, there. They what about fully T went there. What about TOS? I Mud. Well, that's, that's true. Or, or uh, uh, well, I, I Mud, yeah. Requiem for Methuselah. Little Raina yeah. action. I don't know if Kirk got his freak on with her if they had enough time. 
But um, <laughs> he made you know, the time, damn it. Or he Andrea, maybe, and what her little girls made of. I mean, they think about it. You know, they were. Why, why not go there? It's a really, really poor, uh, problematic title. Robert Thank you, Meyer Mo. Burnett, have you been drinking again? No, Stella, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mo. Uh, from Michael Nemo again, attractive <laughs> actors in SNW is the only plus of it being a CW derivative show. I guess mm. you're right on there. Yeah, because they the are all thing. really attractive. Like everyone's attractive. Everything, everything is attractive. It's like by the way, we, we, you know, we got the we got the little. And, and when is when is when is uh, uh, when are we going to get the Nurse Chapel Spock coupling that we oh, really want to see soon? Well, oh, you, you know. haven't you haven't seen episode six yet? Oh, oh, is that is that Very what happens? Soon. Oh, good. Well, yeah. yes. All I'm going to say see is as much there, as you want to see. There's a you moment think she's where she's ever going to brush her hair. There's a moment where you need to shut the door, dim the lights. <laughs> okay and that's that's um, I'm gonna again stop there. again again uh, another way to trash tos canon yeah. just go right ahead oh i hate that yeah I just, just mm-hmm. do whatever you want and 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 first of all if you're married to that actress that they cast as to pring mm. why not bring her with you wherever you go yeah, yeah. because oh, yeah, i yeah, would yeah. i wouldn't be leaving her at home she's your no, wife sh- dude She'd well, be a she's permanent part of my ship. Yeah. If and if they nothing. changed my put, if if they were like, look, she can't be here, or we're gonna, okay, I'm leaving, but sign my 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 papers, I'm out. No, well, she's I'm nothing not, like yeah. her TOS character. I so, mean, this is another thing too that that I think is misunderstood about Vulcans. Vulcans don't mate every seven years. Mm-hmm. They have to mate every seven years. But I would think that Vulcans would make lovemaking a high art. Mm. The Vulcans would probably be amongst the best lovers in the galaxy. That's that's how and, I see it. And I'm sure because they would see it as art, they would see it as as uh, physical forms of pleasuring. They would be amongst the, and no one's ever gone there. But in mm. my head canon, Vulcans were they got it going on. They started the Kumasatra. I see. Yeah, I mean uh, they would yeah. because why wouldn't they? They yeah. would uh, physical pleasuring like that would be would be part of their. They would they they would take it to a high art and see that kind of pleasuring. One, it's logical, right? You we know, see that getting... in Enterprise. Remember yeah, Enterprise yeah. with uh, with DePaul and uh, Tucker. Uh, so first off, her her touch, her 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 massage abilities are like beyond impressive. But then oh. when they finally do uh, break down, he meets her in the. I just watched this episode. He meets her in the mess hall, and and he's like, he's like, listen, uh, last night, right. Uh, He's like he's like still having an audio out of body experience. Oh yeah, <laughs> no, I mean I I would I would give me a give me a Vulcan bride any day of the week. Any day of the week. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Michael Nemo. We've taken this to whole new heights. From Latino Slant, my brother Polly. Big ups to my homeboys in this panel. Fought the locals Ooh. forever. Thank Loda. you, Polly. Locals forever. Yeah, Paulie was going to be on um, this Sunday's uh, Flash panel, but then he realized that it was Father's Day. <laughs> He's oh, like, God, you're right, oh, yeah, yeah, never mind. I can't do it. So mm. I'm going to have nothing but the fatherless degenerates on there on that mm. panel. And, of course, I have kids, but they're going to wait. Mm. Of course they are. <laughs> Thank you, Polly. And uh, Son of John for $10. Mm. I propose. And if anyone wants to join me, cool. That we become spies on the original Canon ST and sneak into Paramount to get into the Star Trek Kurtzman section to hypnotize Alex to change new Trek. <laughs> We've tried. It does, We've it's tried. not as I easy. Yeah. Say, good luck. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Son of John. Thank Appreciate you, Son that. of John. My man. Uh, so what you're saying, Rob, is we're gonna we have something for, to look forward to here with season two. We do. What you said today. <laughs> Is that That's what you passed on to us? No, I mean, look. Is there any redeeming? Yeah. Look, there's a lot of people that are going to like this show because people have, have are, uh, they will. I mean, I know people that are longtime Star Trek fans that like this show. Mm-hmm. You right. know, and um, I don't begrudge anybody that. Good. If you like it, you, you know, you, you should never apologize to anybody about what you like. If you like Amen. some kind of entertainment, just because an old fuck like myself hates it, you don't have to, oh, you don't owe me anything. That's right. And Sex and nor nor it. should you yeah you, nor should you take it personally if I hate something that you like. There's a lot of things I like that I are indefensibly bad, but I like them anyway. Right. Well, so I mean, you just, yeah. and if you like something, you should never. Um, you, you should like never. Super Troopers. Yeah, I'm the sorry, movie, uh, the first uh, Super Troopers. Yeah, not not I'm sorry, not Super Troopers. Uh, 
Yeah, Super Starship Trip Troopers. Starship yeah. Troopers. Oh, I love Starship I love Troopers. Starship Troopers. Yeah. Are you kidding yeah, me? I, Games in theory. <laughs> no, I love I love Starship Troopers. I mean, I'm a huge Paul Verhoeven fan. Yeah. Shit, man, I can't wait for my 4K of Showgirls to get here. Woohoo! Oh my gosh! I want to. Is there a 4K Showgirls, version of Starship Troopers? I'll take that. I, I'll take there is a Steelbook. A, there is there's a there is a 4K Steelbook of Starship Troopers, and let me tell you, that transfer is unbelievable. Right, the 4K to... Starship Troopers is a a must own, and it comes in a cool. It has uh, the Steelbook has very cool art pop like pop comic comic art on it. Mm-hmm. I cannot recommend that disc highly enough. It is so gorgeous. Wow! So you have I'm gonna have to get that. Well, ASAP. I was in the military when that came out, and I began advocating for co-ed showers when Starship Troopers came. Dude, out. Dina Meyer for the win. Is this the is this the one you're talking about? I'm sorry, just I, I want to get off the topic it's, here. Uh, it's kind of got a goofy cover with bugs and on the back skulls and everything. That's not uh, the one. That is not the one. Um, but that's a cool cover. Yeah. That's not the that's not the one that I have. All right, but oh, like um, I'll, nice. I'll find it. I will find it, dude. Yeah. All, All right, I'm books. I'm getting really big into steel books lately. Me too. Um, I didn't want to. I didn't want to. Yeah, get last couple of years, I started. I started. I slowly. I got my first one a couple of years ago, and then I was like, "Well, I'm gonna. I gotta pick up a Stargate one, right? And, oh, I got. I gotta pick up a Serenity one, right? Next thing you know, I'm like, I gotta pick up a." Uh, uh, a vacation, Christmas vacation one, right? <laughs> now I'm like going deep into the steelbook lore. All right, well let's wrap this up because I think we've we've talked about everything we can. I know there's some people out there going to be like, "Oh man, you guys spoiled some stuff." Honestly, I don't think we really spoiled as much as you think. You're going to be if you do, you know, you're excited about watching yeah. Strange New Worlds. There's so much more you're going to get out of it. Don't worry about what we said here today. Uh, we touched on it. Probably will only make your viewing experience a little better once you see it and go, "Oh, I get it now." Yeah, there's so, nothing we can't. There's nothing we can spoil. The show won't spoil for you. <laughs> oh damn! <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, it, yeah. So if, if you guys want to um, watch it tonight, come back tomorrow morning. We're going to have our review. We'll go frame by frame, uh, ups and downs of the entire episode. Um, break it all down for you. And, um, yeah, we'll just keep going. We're going to go all season. We'll be doing that for each week. If you love it, you know, like Rob said, don't apologize. Just love what you love. And, yeah, love what you love. We'll be back here to cover it. We'll be honest, though, about our feelings for it and how, what we think about it. And, um, and we'll just respect each other's opinions because that's what we do around here. That's right. That's how we else, roll. Uh, what, do you got, what do you got going on, Rob? What's, what's happening over on the Burnett Network? I'm just going to sit here and play with my travel pod. Oh, nice. That's it. No, um. Um, I'm gonna start a live stream where he just plays with action figures. Yeah, the yeah, time. no. Um, I could, I'd watch that actually. Tomorrow, uh, we have an action figure stream at 10 a.m. But no, just Rob. I haven't done our observations in a couple days, uh, mm-hmm. just because I've been working on stuff. But I'm gonna go back to doing our observations. Lana, you and reviews. Let's get physical media. All the shows mm-hmm. we do on the Burnett Network. All the shows that RM does. You know, it's funny because I was gonna do a. I honestly, I was gonna go off on a, do a rant, do a Star Trek Strange mm-hmm. New World season two rant. But you know what I figured? You know what I thought about? What's Here's that? what I thought about. I am not, after this stream, I am kind of done with talking shit about Star Trek on my channel. Ooh, nice. Okay. And here's 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 the reason. He's only going to do it on our channel. Yeah. <laughs> Which, uh, it's cathartic. I'll take it. I, yeah. But but I, here's the thing. I've talked about, like, like it, there's just a time when there's a law of diminishing returns. Hmm. And I would rather focus like like doing shows. The last Rob observations I did, I talked about why did they change Captain America, New World Order to Brave New World, right. and that I kind of liked that idea. And I kind of broke down why I thought they might have done it. Yeah, it was a good. And, it was good. And, well, and thank you. And people like that. That people like that channel. I mean, people mm-hmm. like that show. And you know, my channel is really known for positivity yeah. and liking things. And I feel that it's part of my responsibility now that if I'm going to talk about Star Trek, I want to talk about what I like about Star Trek. Mm. And I really enjoyed Star Trek Picard season three. And I liked doing those after shows and talking to Christopher and, yeah. and talking to everybody else, talking to Sean Tretta, talking to Stashwick, talking to Dave Blast, you know. And I think like Bill, uh, Bill Hunt and I are talking about doing a, um, a for all mankind after show but we're going to start with the first episode of the first season and do reviews of every episode because i love that show 
That'd be cool. And do deep dives into that. I, I, I really don't want to talk about, I, I just, I'm tired of it. I, I'm, I, I'd rather talk about things. Look, like, look, I really like The Flash. Hmm. Is it, is it imperfect? I watched uh, Nerd Rotic. I watched Gary Beekler's review of it today. And, you know, I don't think he's necessarily wrong with what he thinks, but I really like The Flash. And coming from a from from a comic book point of view, <clears throat> you know I love comic books and all that. I thought the Flash was wildly entertaining. Yeah, I was I was wildly entertained by it. I had a big grin the whole time. And okay, if you're going to complain about the CG, there's a lot of CG, and of course it it's it. When people complain about bad CG, I don't think they're really complaining about bad CG. I think they're complaining about the design of the shots, like. They think like the way things look wouldn't look that way. Like what they're responding to is a style as opposed to because it doesn't look the way they want it to look or something. I, I don't right. know. But but I really liked a, an over-reliance on CG. Is, but I, I liked The Flash a lot. I thought it was a lot of fun. I, as a matter of fact, you know, into the Spider-Verse, across the Spider-Verse, Guardians of the Galaxy, um, uh, to a certain extent, The Little Mermaid. I think we're getting movies that are good. That they're they're not bad, and um, mm-hmm. Super Mario Brothers, Fast X was bad, and Thank I for you. me Little yes. Mermaid was Thank so Fast boring. X was terrible. Fast X was bad. I, yeah. I well, like well, Fast, Fast X. I like Fast Fast X because it was so bad. But but no, yeah, no, I no, think no. Little Mermaid was too long. But you so can't boring, you dude. can't deny though that the craft was there. Like I just. I was enjoying the craft of the movie making the whole time. Yeah, but it was just so boring. Mm. Well, yeah, also right. Spider Verse I think is the best movie of the year so far. That's the one, the oh, one movie incredible. I haven't seen yet. I've seen all these other movies that everyone, you know, that I that are are not very good, but I haven't seen Spider Verse yet. Yeah, I mean, and, and mm. when it comes to Star Trek, you know, I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of like out anyway after Picard season three. I need I need a writing staff of people that care about Star Trek that that it makes it make it their life's ambition the way Terry yes. Terry Metalis certainly did, and um, and his writing staff certainly did. And there's people. It's really interesting because you can't say that Star Trek Picard season uh, three. People some people said it sucked, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, you might not like it, but it didn't suck. Hundred percent didn't suck. You know, and you can't say that. And and so. Um, you know, I, I'd rather just Star Trek has been around for a long time. There's so much Star Trek that I love that exists. I'm going to concentrate on that. Well, I think that's, that's awesome that you're doing yeah. that. And, <clears throat> and I want to see how, how long it lasts till the next thing pisses you off. Probably about a back. week. <laughs> but let me, yeah. let me ask you this question. So I do have a actually serious three Star Trek days later. <laughs> um, I didn't watch Strange New World again. <laughs> <laughs> so seriously though, with the writer's strike going on, um, I'm thinking that the longer the writer's strike goes on, the more time uh, Paramount has to really think about the impact Picard season three has had on the Star Trek franchise and, and allows them to adjust their plans for the future. What do you think of that? Oh, I think, I think uh, absolutely. And I think, you know, they'll look at, they'll look at these numbers of, of what they're doing with Star Trek compared to look, they've got Picard. They have the numbers there and Paramount's also looking at the, Taylor Sheridan stuff. I mean, he's got mm-hmm. that new spy th- series coming out with Zoe Saldana and Nicole Kidman. That's right. I'm tuning in for that. That shit looks dope. Yeah, you know, and um, they'll they'll see. I mean, there's a lot of really interesting stuff. Look, I got to tell you, I can't wait for Secret Invasion. People mm-hmm. are sleeping on that shit, but I I read the scripts and I loved it. Right. I mean, in terms of a in terms of a mm-hmm. sci-fi conspiracy thriller action global thing i mean i love the scripts it two pe- the people reviewed the reviews have come out of the first two episodes and um i really loved the scripts a lot wow and so i'm, I'm looking then. forward to that you know i'm i'm mm-hmm. looking forward to secret invasion i think there's a lot of stuff to look forward to we got oppenheimer coming out can't yes, wait for I'm that excited about that yes. you know we've got <clears throat> uh, mission impossible dead reckoning which mm-hmm. looks like it's gonna be the shit Oh, I can't wait great. for that. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that is Indiana is, Jones five. I mean, Indiana, coming, yeah. and you know what? I'll tell you something. Even mm. I think I'm going to like Indiana Jones five. I might not mm. love it, but by reading about that movie, I think it's been. I mean, look, I love James Mangold. I trust mm. in Mangold. Am I going to think I it's do. the greatest movie in the world? Probably not. But I would imagine I'll like it mm. because everything I know about it, I'm like, what's not to like? Mm. You know, Fair it's, enough. it's, it's, so I, 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 I'm looking forward to that. 
Um, so I want to, yeah, I want to concentrate more on, on, on. St- I mean, I know that that I just it just gets tiresome to talk about. What I would like to focus on, though, is more of the culture wars that we are in the middle of. Mm. And I think that that there is a real, mm. uh, you know, I, I watched a really interesting. Con- well, you probably want to get off the stream, screen, stream, but I, I watched a, I, I, I watched a really interesting. <clears throat> It was with what, what's the organization Black, uh, not Blackstone, Black Rock. Black Rock yeah, mm-hmm. it was, and they were talking about <clears throat> this is back from like 2016, and they were talking about how can corporations, how can you change the world, and and they were talking about you have to move people's like I really believe that this culture war that we're in, I'm not a tinfoil conspiracy theorist, but it has been engineered. Mm. I mean, all of all of this social media, it, it, these issues, whether we're talking about, you know, equity and inclusion and and trans and, and uh, gender issues and things like that, that it all popped up in the last 10 years. Very specifically sleight of hand, man. It's and I, yeah, it's, distractions. it's, it's yeah. totally by design. And it's 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 be it's been a lot of big money. And I think that BlackRock is one of the organizations behind it all. Oh, this is what, and they're doing. They do it. Look, it's. Mm. I wish it was about something other than money, but it's not. Mm. And you know, it's all. It's just about money, and it's about where. Where can we consolidate? Our, we'll make people worried about over here while we consolidate our money over here. You know, and and we have with a, uh, AI coming down the pike, with new technologies coming down the pike. There's a lot of really interesting things. We have a lot of moral and ethical decisions we have to make as a culture. Mm. there's one race of people on this planet there's homo sapiens that's it unless we discover that aliens are actually here which is also very exciting and i'd like to do more of of, it can you imagine what would happen if they just announced that like there's irrefutable proof that yes and not only that but here's one of them that would be cool we would need that we because i honestly think if even if they announce it people would be like oh okay cool and they would just go i feel like a lot of people would be like oh that's super rad yeah. And then move on and move on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, know, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff happening. Mm-hmm. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, I want to con- I'll tell you something else. I just read an amazing book. Andy Weir, who wrote The Martian. Mm-hmm. He also wrote a book called Artemis. His latest book that came out a couple of years ago is called Project Hail Mary. Okay. Um, I read that book and people keep telling me to read it. I'm like, okay, I'm going to get around to it. I'm going to get around to it. Finally, I got it two, two weekends ago. I get the book. Mm-hmm. I open it up. I was 200 pages in before I stopped. Elizabeth came. I was in the kitchen. I opened it. I opened the uh, Amazon box, took the book out, and I just started reading. Oh my! And gosh. before I came up for air, I was 200 pages in. Oh my! And God. then I finished the book off in a second sitting. It's like 460 pages or something. It's going to get made into a movie apparently next year. They're mm-hmm. going to start shooting it. If we're going to get stuff like that, I mean, it's a very. It has nothing to do with Star Trek, but it has the ethos of a great Star Trek story. Oh, the, the premise of this story is but phenomenal. Don't, don't read anything. Oh, don't don't I just read, read the premise. Okay, but don't read anything about it okay, because right, there's around. so much joy <clears throat> to be had <throat> in the way the story is told because it, it takes place in the present day and then there's flashbacks. Oh, okay. And it's so it's it's like two parallel tracks. This book was, if you can call a book delicious, mm. it was intellectually delicious to read. Oh, it was man. so much fun to read. More it's such right a now. great, uplifting um science fiction story uh project hail mary and and uh read that you know i mean if 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 you want a fix of of populist optimistic Mm -hmm. science fiction uh read that book and i tell Mm -hmm. it there's an audio version of it but i just had a big i had a big grin on my face um the whole time and then i right after that book i read one of the most disgusting disturbing (laughs) Um, books I'm trying to it literally is about the book is set uh, it was written by a female Argentinian author I want to say it's called The Taste of basically uh, a virus makes it impossible for humans to eat meat so we very quickly pivot and start raising other humans for food that 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 disease is called veganism (laughs) Uh, and that I was reading good. that book and man, and, and the, the whole <laughs> idea of how easy it is for us to dehumanize a population and how we just start eating people. Yeah. Just, send me that. Cool. Send, send me that. What, what, what book is that, please? 
uh, the I'm eating people right book. Now. Yeah, uh, buy it right now. Hang on, let me. I'll tell you what what it's called. We're gonna need your reading list, Rob. So uh, <laughs> there's a way, I'm, I'm telling I you, do. I love it. Let's see. I gotta <clears throat> sign in. Hang on. Um, yeah, let me see. Uh, I should, people are always asking me to make a reading list, mm -hmm. and um, I should. I, I keep on. I'm gonna. I'm gonna start doing that. That's another thing I'm gonna do on my my channels. Rob's uh, ten and twenty. Yes, we. Where you, I give you, lists I know of you've 10. been working on that. We're yeah, excited about and that. okay, let's see. Let me tell you what this book is called. Uh, oh, and I've also been reading Jonathan Hickman's X Men run. It's called Tender Is the Flesh. Oh shit! Oh, Tender Jesus. Is the Flesh. It's by Augustina. Baz Tarika. And uh, I guess it was a big book on amongst the young on TikTok. Mm -hmm. They talked about it a lot on TikTok. Yeah, the dystopian horror novel everyone is talking about. TikTok made me buy this book. Um, it was very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I wouldn't say it was a pleasant read. Really? But it was uh, disturbing. It was it was pretty disturbing. Now I'm reading a, a book called Pen Pal by Dathan Arbach um, that I just started, which is in again interesting. Um mm. But yeah, Ellen, you know what else I read? Oh, dude. I read the script for the sequel to John Carpenter's The Thing. Oh, no. oh, oh yeah? And yeah, and about. it's, it's, mm. it's, uh, I was on a, I got a, a bunch of new scripts. I was on a script reading binge. Mm. Uh, it, apparently, it was going to be a limited series, a limited TV series that Frank Darabont was going to produce. Mm. But it, it, it opens with the title three days later. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. After and and it's really interesting. And I'm like, why the fuck didn't this get made? Yeah, Did you make well, this I shit. Why it didn't? And it's a sequel to the movie. It, it it's it's good. Do you think they'll make it? Or I don't think. I don't think. I mean, no. there is so many. If pick your favorite genre thing, mm. somebody had bought it at one point, optioned it, and there's a script. You can find us. Like I can't say what it is. Are you guys Stephen King fans? Oh, big big chain is. Uh, well, let me tell you, there is a, if you're a Stephen King fan, there is something of his that every Stephen King fan loves mm. that has yet to be made into mm. a movie. Oh, um, yes. And it's going to get made. Mm. The director is signed. I have the screenplay. It was, it's great. I can't say what it is because it has not been officially announced. But if I if I would it, can I it, guess? It, I'm, I can't tell you what it is. But okay, wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. You can guess. Hang on. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna say the long walk. <laughs> Please make the long walk. That's all I'm this gonna is, say. Let's this say, is he's got bad a great stone face. No, he's got a great stone face. It's good. He's not gonna. He's not gonna give it up. No, he there's, actually there's, froze. He actually froze. No, I didn't freeze. No, I can't, I didn't, <laughs> it I was can't. good. I Imagine if he you. had froze right there. We were trying to guess based on his freeze. Just, just note, there are very few Stephen King things that have not been adapted. Very mm -hmm. few. He's almost all of his shit's been adapted. So, has um, it been adapted before mm -hmm. for like TV or something? What this, this what, project? What, this project you're time. talking about has it been adapted for TV or anything, or is it just a brand new adaption? Oh, it's brand new. Oh. Look in the private chat. Um, there, there's only there's only a few Stephen King's uh, things that I care about. Yes, there's only a few Stephen King stories that I care about because I'm not a big fan of Shane is, and they've already been done on TV for the most yeah. part, and they've been done poorly. So yeah, this has never been yeah, done, absolutely. and a very interesting director who's done a lot of big stuff that um, I think is a really good choice for it, and the script is fucking great. Mm, God, I can't wait. Yeah. Somebody else said Eyes of the Dragon. That would make a great one as well. That's and that hasn't been adapted either. No, it has not. And they, what you and guys got to do is when that movie comes out, you and Rob need to do a special Palantar stream. Uh, stream. Well, yeah, if he wants to come on, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because you guys well, are well, both I'll, King I'll tell you. I'll tell you one thing. Um, if 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 this project actually goes before the cameras that I'm talking about, we could mm -hmm. do a hell of a stream with the people involved. Oh, that cool. that that would be sick. Yeah. Let's, yeah, for you guys, I'll because engineer it. I'll be in or, the back. Or, <laughs> or when it's announced, it would be cool to do a kickoff stream. Like we could probably oh, yeah. do a kickoff with the director and the producer. Mm. Oh, and... that'd be rad. That'd you be know rad. what? I'll tell you. I'll tell you something. I also read a script that I also read that is fucking bananas. Mm. So Andy Kevin Walker, who wrote Seven, I'll tell. Mm. Okay, this here's a great Hollywood. Here's a great Hollywood story. 
So 33 years ago, I worked for Silver Pictures. I worked for Joel Silver. And I was a reader at Silver Pictures. So there, I was one of two staff readers. So whenever scripts would come in, I would read the scripts. And, you know, you're supposed to say yes, no, maybe, whatever. Mm -hmm. No one ever says yes to a script. There was an agent who I believe at the time was with Bauer Benedict, which later became UTA. And the agent's name was Gavin Pallone. Gavin Pallone represented, he was Andy Kevin Walker's manager, Andy Kevin Walker, who wrote Seven. So in 1990, mm. I was sent Seven to read. Mm. Five years before the movie got made. The movie came out oh, wow. in 95. No one had read this script. Andy Kevin Walker was a clerk at Tower Records. Bauer Benedict, uh, uh, Gavin Pallone sent it over. I read the script. I begged people to read it for weeks. Oh my god! The they finally decided to read it, and they hired Andy Kevin Walker to write a movie called "Lie to Me" based on a book that never got made. But he he wrote the script. Seven got made, whatever. So I'm having lunch with this producer that I know, and this was last week, and I told him this story, and the producer brings out his phone, and he goes, "Look at who the last person to call me was," and it was <laughs> Gavin Pallone. Was it really? It was Gavin, the, the agent. Gavin Pallone has directed Andy Kevin Walker's latest script, Psycho Killer. Mm. And so this producer said, do you want to read Psycho Killer? And I'm like, do I? So I read Psycho Killer. And Psycho Killer is shot already. It's already coming out. And oh, Gavin okay. Pallone directed it. And a lot of people don't like Gavin Pallone. Now he's been a producer and he used to write this column and he's made a lot of enemies, but he wouldn't give up the rights to this script because he, he held on it for years and years and years so he could make it. So this producer said, the, actually the producer is going to see the first cut of Psycho Killer next week. Hmm. And uh, it was just, for me, it was like full circle. It was funny yeah. telling this producer this story about 33 years ago and then he goes, look, I mean, it was weird, but so... Everybody who likes horror movies, I look out when you see Psycho Killer come out. Very Psycho cool. Killer, directed by Gavin Pallone, written by Andy Kevin Walker. So wait, did I just hear you say you're part of the reason Seven got made? I wouldn't say that I was one of the pe reasons that Seven got made, but I was definitely one of the reasons that my advocacy for the script at Silver Pictures did get Andy Kevin Walker hired and brought mm -hmm. out to Hollywood. Damn, that is and great. and as a result of that, um, uh, you know, when you find a script like that, you hope you're going to get promoted to mm -hmm. like a creative executive and work your way up. That didn't happen. My boss at the time, after about three weeks, actually called me at home and said, I'm going to take credit for finding the script. <laughs> And and he was my boss. I mean, there was nothing. So I was Hollywood. just I was just a reader, mm -hmm. and I just wanted you to know that. So stop talking about how great this script is because we're going to bring Andy Kevin Walker out to write this movie. Lie to me, and I'm like, okay. I mean, but can I get a promotion? You know, mm -hmm. uh, it shows you I can get. But but I didn't get that, and and I didn't mm -hmm. stay at Silver Pictures. Although I did wind up making a movie with Joel Silver back in 2008. Um, so you never know. You know, you, you can never really get mad at people and be like, fuck you. Right, right. No burning bridges. Not in Hollywood. Yeah, or, or you can still burn bridges, and if you become successful enough, people will hire you and put up with your shit anyway. Yeah, but, <laughs> that's you know. true. But, but no, I mean, that, that's a true story. So everybody look out for Psycho Killer. Psycho Killer, man, such good stuff. Psycho Killer. There's a lot of, there's, that's why I'm saying I want to focus on the good things. Awesome. Well, it sounds so like there's a lot of exciting things coming. Secret Invasion, <clears throat> I'm stoked, man. Stoked for it. Because it's a, probably... it's a really interesting science fiction story. Hmm. Well, I'm. You've already read it, so I, I believe you, obviously. So, um, well, I don't know how the out, execution but... was. I like the scripts. Right. Well, if it's written well, that's the first step. So it was. Right. That's the one thing you can't really fix. <laughs> you know, if it's screwed, if you screw up the writing, it's it's just going to be a bad product. So it's no She-Hulk. <clears throat> no She-Hulk. <laughs> Not breaking the fourth wall. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Rob. If you guys haven't already subscribed over at Rob's channel, the Burnett Network, make sure you guys get over there and do it. I'm sure everybody subscribed, but uh, always the best content. Thank you for coming on here today to share your thoughts of, of uh, Strange New World Season 2. Thanks for putting up with me. Uh, we'll get to more. No, we, we love it. You, you always make things exciting. We love your takes. So uh, make you sure do. you guys tune in with us tomorrow. People always. like that. Turn into that channel again.
That's fine. If they don't come back, that's their loss. Come to the Burnout Network. Yeah. Like, subscribe, hit the notification bell <laughs> <laughs> while you're here. Um, and, uh, of course, we'll see you guys tomorrow with, with uh, the review of Strange New Worlds, uh, Episode 1, Season 2. So, uh, can you clear that up? How, how is that yeah. working out? We're doing the ups, ups and Downs is releasing at 6 a.m., right? Oh, yeah. So, we're actually going to record that tonight, Brian, Brian and I are. Right. And then we'll release it uh, in the morning. You get that at 6 a.m. And then, of course, we'll come on the show live at 12, and we're going to talk about it uh, live at that time. So the frame by frame review is going to be going live uh, as a recording at six a.m. and then we'll be Pacific, back yeah. at twelve thirty for Unleashed. That's it. All right. And uh, that's it. Anything else, Brian? Uh, yeah. If you can't, if for some reason you are completely and totally gone tomorrow, and you still want to watch a live stream, then on on Friday it's the Palantir, and on Saturday it's Salty Nerds, and on Sunday it's mm. the Popcorn Power Hour. Then back on Monday it's Raw Rant. So How do we every get day the schedule this where every day we're doing something? It's crazy. Somehow it's worked out where every single day we are live streaming. Awesome. All right, guys. We love you guys. Take care. Have a good week. Don't morning. go away. I mean, you don't guys go, don't go away. Oh, yeah. We, we won't go away. Don't worry. We we're staying. Away. What am I doing? Here we go. Well, let's judge booth babes at Comic-Con. You can't do that no more. Make engaging.